you, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to tonight's council meeting. I apologize, we had an in-camera session that went a little bit late. Uh, first order of business for tonight's meeting of Tuesday, June the 25th is the singing of O Canada. And uh, Jade Atkinson, is Jade here? Oh, you're Jade, okay. So Jade, if you wanna step up to one of the microphones and make sure the red light is on, and let me uh, just do a little introduction. Is it on there, yeah, uh, Councillor Campbell? They're on. they're on? Okay, they're all on? Okay, great. So Jade Atkinson is a 16-year-old singer here in Niagara Falls. She's in the teen choir at Stamford Lane United. She's been singing in the choir for 10 years. Her love of music comes from her nanny, who's a music teacher. She attends Stamford High School where she studies music as well. Jade also plays, we have a Stamford grad <laughs> over here. From the Stone Age, mind you, but still, back in the day. Jade also plays many instruments as, and is passionate about pursuing music in high school and beyond. So Jade, whenever you're ready. Oh, Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love in all our sons command with glory. on behalf of the city and all of us here in the gallery today, I want to say thank you very much. You did a terrific job. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're ready to start our meeting tonight. We are looking for the passing of the council minutes from the June 4th so meeting. Moved by Councilor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councilor Campbell. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved, thank you. Do we have any disclosures of a pecuniary interest? Uh, Councilor Cario. Uh, PD 2019-39 on the uh, boarding house study. Uh, it's about motels and motels, and I have a hotel and motel. Okay, thank you. Councilor, any other disclosures? Okay, seeing none, um, we'll quickly jump into the best part of the meeting. This is the mayor's remarks. Everyone always looks forward to this. The only night I'm excited about it, George. So first off, obituaries. Uh, uh, Ricky Crabb, the son of Kathy Crabb, who works in the mayor and CAO's office, Ricky was a former Chippewa volunteer fire, firefighter who passed away, as well as Karen Ann Peoples, the niece of Dale Morton of the CAO's office. Our condolences go out to both of their families. Announcements. Uh, first, uh, we, we last time announced some new staff members. Well, we have another new staff member that we'd like to introduce today, and I would invite Donna Jakes, if she would please stand up, if we could introduce the new solicitor and director of legal services. So next week, uh, as is the tradition, she will sing O Canada here in Chambers. <laughs> Has anybody told her yet? Not yet? Okay. So Donna has held previous solicitor positions in private practice and with the municipality of Chatham-Kent, as well as with the city of Guelph. So she has an awful lot of experience. 
Most recently, she was the general counsel for the Ontario Northland Transportation Commission. And Donna, we'd like to welcome you here to Niagara Falls. Thank you. You're welcome. Just thank us with a good job singing next meeting. <laughs> Canada Day, speaking of Canada Day, please join us on Monday, July the 1st, for our Ni Niagara Falls tradition, the Canada Day Parade. It begins 11 a.m. sharp in downtown Niagara Falls. So there's a whole bunch of Canada Day activities that day as well, including a 1K and 5K run uh, or walk, which takes place at Oaks Park for St. John Ambulance. Uh, that takes place 9 a.m. on uh, Canada Day. There's a citizenship ceremony at the Niagara Falls Public Library at 9.15 a.m. for a number of new Canadians. The Niagara Falls Concert Band performance will be 10.15 until 11 in front of the Niagara Falls Public Library. After the parade, be sure to make your way up to the stage in front of City Hall. 12.30 p.m. There'll be opening ceremonies, live entertainment, there'll be a children's zone, artisan market, a Canada Day car show, extreme music and sports area, food vendors, buskers, and more. So join us downtown Niagara Falls for the parade and then the events after the Canada Day parade. I'd like to th thank Councillor Dabrowski for representing the city at the ninth annual Italian Heritage <coughs> Month flag raising. It's funny, eh? we got all these Italians on council, we had to get Dabrowski to do the Italian flag raising. Uh, as well as representing the city at the Niagara One Awards Gala. Uh, Councillor Strange for representing the city at the Color Run Fundraiser presented by the Ladies Auxiliary of Club Italia and Miss Club Italia. The annual School Crossing Guard <coughs> Appreciation Evening and the Philippines Independence Day flag raising. No, <laughs> and he's got new glasses now too. Do um, uh, you want to put them on? Uh, he's got bifocals. He's now wearing bifocals officially, folks. He looks looks smart though. Yeah, you look smart though. Uh, smarter. Uh, Councillor Thompson for representing the city at the Hornblower Niagara Funicular Launch Event. That's the little train trams that take you down to the Hornblower that are, is now open, especially for those people that don't like, uh, that are claustrophobic and don't like elevators. You can take the funicular down now. And Councillor Lococo for representing the city at the grand opening of, the St of Steve Wilson Studios and Art Gallery on Queen Street. Uh, and last but not least, uh, for those of you that have been paying attention, we've been having a, cr um, a, a recruitment drive for lifeguards in the city of Niagara Falls and we've tried all sorts of things to encourage more kids to finish off their first aid and, and do the courses they need to do to become lifeguards. And of course, we did some research and we had a research department on it and they realized that one of the most famous lifeguards, well, there were two that came up. One was John McBain and you know the, the McBain Center uh, named after his parents. John McBain was a Niagara Falls youth who went on to become extremely successful, started auto trader, went on to become a, a multi-billionaire, lives in uh, Switzerland, Switzerland now, uh, and he was a great lifeguard and a great example for kids today of when you become a lifeguard, it could lead to so many great things. And then the other person that we found just as reputable and noble and respectable, of course, was the longest serving and most handsome and best dressed mayor in the, the history city, Wayne Thompson. And we did a little bit of research to find out what was his secret to lifeguard success. And we went through our archives and we found a picture of him. And could we, could, Bill, could you get that on the screen, please? <laughs> yes. How about a big hand for Wayne Thompson? <laughs> yeah, no, no. Now, <laughs> needless to say, there were many women who had drowning incidents in the pool to be saved by his worship, Wayne Thompson. So, uh, <laughs> that was only from a couple of weeks ago, by the way. I want you to know he's still taking care of himself. And the last uh, item, of course, is our next council meeting. We go to our summer, summer schedule. It will be Tuesday, July the 16th. So we encourage everyone to tune in. So, moving on to uh, appointments and presentations. Uh, first up tonight, uh, uh, regional count. We're joined today by regional councillor Peter Nicholson, uh, and he has a guest with him that he's going to recognize tonight. 
And uh, what I'd like to do maybe is call Peter and his guest. His guest's name is Piper Hollingsworth. She's 11 years old. And I'm going to uh, invite Peter to join me up here as we <coughs> give her a set. There's a, a Piper, you can come around this way. See the doorway there? Nice to see you again. Come on up this way, Piper. Come on over here. So we're welcomed uh, by our regional counselor, Peter Nicholson. And uh, Peter, I thought maybe uh, if you'd like to maybe say a few words about the Piper. Sure, yeah, well, I'm happy to be here with uh, Piper Hollingsworth. I, uh, I attended a fundraiser not too long ago at the Niagara Falls Humane Society, and it was called Rough Night at the Shelter. And uh, that's where I met Piper. It was a volunteer event where volunteers could raise money and spend a night in then one of the uh, dog kennels with the uh, rescue animals. So I met Piper there. She was the youngest volunteer at the event. So she's 11 years old. She's a student at Martha Colmer School. And she wants to be a veterinarian uh, someday. And what's impressive about Piper is she raised the most money at that uh, event. So uh, being the youngest one, she raised over $2,300. And, uh, <laughs> Later, what's equally as impressive is that she regularly volunteers at the Humane Society. So she's an example of someone who's working hard in the community, doing what she loves, and uh, helping to make our community a better place. So uh, I'm happy to, to be here and recognize her hard work and uh, her leadership in our community. So keep up the great work. Thank you, Peter. Yes. yes. <laughs> and did you get that? It's the rough night, dual, uh, double entendre, they call that? Rough, yeah. rough. Anyway, let's say uh, <laughs> I get it. And Piper, I'd also like to present uh, to you. I know that uh, Regional Councillor Nicholson pre presented her certificate at the Regional Council meeting on Thursday of last week. And uh, today also on behalf of the city, I'll read to you. On behalf of the members of City Council, I extend my congratulations to Piper Hollingsworth. That's a good name, eh? Piper Hollingsworth. It's very rich sounding for your dedication in fundraising. For the Humane Society is the top fundraiser. Love is a four-legged word. So I'd like to present this to you as well, kiddo. That's for you. And a little grab bag of a few goodies that uh, we'd like to give to you as well. Yeah. So can we do a picture? Okay, let's get in here for a picture. Right. Dale, can I get one? Yeah. I don't know, blocker. Oh, sorry. Did you want to say anything? <laughs> I said, Piper, is there something you'd like to say? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right, it's nice to meet you. That's for you, Kevin. Nice to see you again. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right, next uh, I'd like to call up Ben Harper. Ben's gonna join us at the podium. <clears throat> Welcome, Ben. Thanks. So Ben, an Ottawa Senator's defenseman, he's here to speak about a charitable event, and we'd like to uh, welcome you here to our chambers. I think this is a little low for me, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Ben Harper. Uh, I'm currently playing with the Ottawa Senators in the NHL. Um, if you looked me up online, I know that it says that I was from Hamilton. I was actually born there, but uh, when I was one years old, I uh, was moved down here in uh, 1996 with my family, and I've called Niagara home ever since. Um, when I had the opportunity to, to start a charity event uh, back in my hometown, um, I thought that Jumpstart would be uh, a great charity to go through. I think that my family, uh, especially between my hockey and my brother's hockey and my sister was a basketball player as well. I think I know the, the amount of commitment and, and time and, and money that goes into uh, you know, putting your kid through sport and I'm sure a lot of people in this room uh, understand that as well. Um, so when I, when I came across Jumpstart, I thought it made a lot of sense for, for me to do a, a charity event in support of them and uh, be able to give you know, every kid the, the equal opportunity to, to play sport, which has given me so much, whether it's, you know, to be able to chase my dream and play in the NHL or 
or create fen friendships that you know hopefully I'll have forever. Um, yeah, so uh, July 19th, we're going to do it at the Gale Center. I want to say thanks to uh, Rob McDonald and, and the people at the Gale for, for supporting this. Obviously, none of it uh, would, would be possible without them. Um, it's going to be an all-day ball hockey tournament uh, for kids ages 7 to 14. Uh, I'm going to try and round up as many of my NHL buddies as possible and get them to come down for the day, and, and the kids can, can have a fun-filled day and, and hopefully meet some of their NHL heroes. And, uh, it'll all be uh, for a great cause in Jumpstart, and um, the great thing about Jumpstart also, 100% of the donations uh, will be going back to, to the Niagara region. So I think that's awesome. That's great. Uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, hold on. Hey, Ben. So uh, uh, do we have any members of council that have any questions for Ben or that want to do a little three-on-three -three with him uh, at his turn? What's that? Am I putting a team in? Yeah, I played that little hockey, you know, little, yeah. yeah. So uh, hey, do we have any questions of counsel uh, for Mr. Harper? Yes, Counselor well, Strange. Like thank you, Ben, for coming down and doing this, this great initiative. You know, you're our celebrity here in, in Niagara Falls and uh, um, watch you uh, play on TV and, and a big name like this and give them back to the community and give them back to So I want to thank you. Hopefully we can get your buddy Zen and out and uh, participating. And, no yeah. fighting. Yeah, I know Zen well. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions or comments for, for Ben? <clears throat> so Ben, on, on yes, and I yes, and I almost thank you, Bill. Uh, if I could uh, just get you to join yep. me here, if you can come through the gate here. Oops. You want to stand on the stool? Uh, What's that? Or stand on the stool or something? Yeah. And someone give me a ladder, please. Uh, <laughs> he's uh, a little bit taller than the little girl that we had here earlier. <laughs> Yeah, that's great to see you. So Ben, uh, this is a little gift. It's uh, it's a cutting board, or they call it a what do they call it? What's the fancy word for it? Charcuterie board. Oh, oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> He's cultured too, and uh, as well as some handmade coasters that were made right here in Niagara Falls at Heartland Forest. So real neat thing that we do, and we try to support them. And then it's a nice gift and a little keepsake for you as well, Ben. I got a new house, closed on a Friday, so it's going to be a great gift. Oh, right on, perfect. Chakuri, we're all going to come to the opening. That would be great. Smile. You notice when I said that, he didn't say yes? He didn't agree? No. <laughs> so, yeah, thanks thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, next up, the Niagara Region. Their transportation services is here to make a presentation. I understand we have Frank Tassone, Associate Director of Transportation Engineering, who used to also work here. Carolyn Ryle, Director of Transportation Services Division, who is originally from Niagara Falls as well. They're gonna update council on the region's five-year forecast. So welcome, our regional friends. Thank you, welcome. Uh, Mayor Council, thank you for having the region here this evening. Uh, Frank and I are pleased to be here to talk about the five-year forecast. Uh, we've been going around to all the different municipalities because we feel it's very important to show the investment that we're making in all the different municipalities from the regional perspective. Um, throughout 2019, we have close to $9 million of infrastructure being put into uh, place here in Niagara Falls. And our draft five-year forecast is roughly uh, $47 million um, that we're putting forward over our next five-year outlook. Um, so just to talk a little bit about um, when we're looking at the capital budgeting process, which we're into right now for uh, 2019, uh, we look at network expansion and when we refer, what we refer to when we talk about network expansion is you know, any capacity improvements that we deal with with regards to roads, so new roads or widening of the roads. We look obviously at intersection improvements, so that could be signalizing or left turn lanes, uh, road rehabilitation programs, which are upgrades to roads or a hot mix program, and then obviously we take care of any uh, repairs with regards to major culverts or bridge replacements or rehabs. So I'm now gonna pass it over to Frank. He's gonna outline the major investments that are going on throughout Niagara Region, uh, throughout Niagara Falls, and with all the great work that's been happening with the partnership of staff here as well. Thanks, Frank. Okay, I'm gonna try to keep this short. Uh, I think uh, Mayor Diodati has a charcuterie board for me <laughs> if I keep it front or five minutes here. You do. <laughs> Okay, so the, the first projects that uh, we're gonna highlight are on uh, McLeod Road. So the very first project is McLeod Road widening from the Hydro Canal to Wilson Crescent. Uh, this, this project includes uh, the rehabilitation of the road stretch, uh, including upgrades to illumination. The current um, 
forecast has this project in, in 2021. And uh, we're currently also uh, coordinating with OPG uh, to try and coordinate this with their uh, canal refurbishment project. So we are uh, in conversations with them uh, at, in the current time. Second project on the Cloud Road is intersection improvements at Drummond Road. So the city is carrying out some improvements on Drummond Road south of McLeod. And the region has put forward some money to cost share in that project to take care of the intersection as well. So uh, we are coordinating our funding along with the city's funding for, for that project. <coughs> Next project is McLeod Road Pumping Station. So uh, you might not all be aware, but the underpass on McLeod Road at Stanley Avenue uh, requires a storm water pumping station to take the water from underneath the underpass and, and get rid of that storm water. Uh, the pumps are in need of upgrades, so we're working with our water wastewater section to design and replace the pumps and do some modifications and some upgrades to that storm water pumping station. Uh, that's looking like it's going to go to construction in 2020. Next project we have is the intersection <coughs> improvements at Montrose Road, um, Thorold Stone in Montrose in particular. Um, this is uh, including an operational review. So in 2021, we have an operational review to, to identify any operational upgrades that may be required at that intersection, very busy intersection. Uh, we also anticipate that the uh, the ministry is going to be uh, coming through there with some work so um, it'll tie in with their work to make sure that any upgrades to that intersection are carried out uh, next one we have is thorough stone road improvements at cardinal drive this is the addition of turn lanes at the cardinal drive intersection we are currently in a holding pattern on this project uh, waiting for the development on the northeast uh, side of that intersection or corner of that intersection to move forward. It's been in the works for several years and we're just waiting to see how that materializes to determine if there's any other operational improvements required there. Uh, we have one other one which is improvements at Dorchester and as many of you are aware, uh, the ministry is moving forward with a uh, project to replace or sorry, rehabilitate the overpass at Thorold Stone Road which may include uh, restriction of uh, rolling acres drive, and that may put additional pressure on the intersection of Thorough Stone at Dorchester. So we have to do an operational study there to determine whether that warrants any further lanes uh, or any other works in that regard. Okay, Thorough Stone extension east of Stanley. This would be the second phase. The first phase up to the Gale Center is complete. This will be the second phase of the project, which brings uh, Thorough Stone Road all the way to the intersection of Bridge and Victoria. Right now we have funds uh, allocated to construct the roundabout in 2020, so that will take care of the intersection. And our thought process behind that is to construct the roundabout in 2020, that way we can separate the remainder of Thorough Stone Road from the Bridge Street improvements, which you'll see a slide on further down, uh, down the presentation. That allows us to con construct those two other sections simultaneously if need be. So we're trying to keep up with, uh, with GO and, and their, uh, their momentum as they move more trains to the area. Uh, the next slide is Bridge Street. So we have Bridge Street from Victoria to Erie Avenue. And that's, a, that's going to be a collaboration project between the region and city. Uh, they have a lot of buried infrastructure in the area that needs to be taken care of as well as Erie Avenue. So we're wrapping all that together with, with city staff into one environmental assessment and then we'll be moving forward uh, with detailed design. We're looking at 2022, 2021, 22 uh, for construction uh, of that project. Regional Road 98, Montrose Road from Charnwood to McLeod Road. So that is currently uh, being awarded to a contractor. That includes a road section from McLeod to Charnwood and includes road platform upgrades as well as buried infrastructure for the city. There is going to be a long-term closure of, uh, of Montrose Road to assist the contractor on that project. There are some very, very poor soils in the area and the storm sewers are very deep. So for the safety of the workers and, and the, uh, the residents, uh, we don't feel that it's adequate to have traffic moving through the area once we start. So there is going to be a long-term closure and we're currently working on detouring uh, plans for that. 
Uh, some, some of the structures you may not be aware and you don't see all of them. So the first one that we have is Montrose Road Culvert. This is uh, located just to the north of Creek Road. We have that uh, in, the, uh, in the structures program for 2022 for a rehab on that. Region Road 20 at Lundy's Lane, sorry, 20 Lundy's Lane at, uh, at Dorchester Road. We have money in, the, in our forecast for an operational study to determine if there's any improvements that can be made. As most of you are aware, it's a very tight intersection. There's not a lot of property to, to deal with. Um, but we are looking at if there's any operational improvements that can be make, made to help that intersection. And the other one is rehabilitation of Lundy's Lane from Highland to Montrose. This is another joint project that's being completed uh, with, between the region and the city. Uh, our water wastewater section also has a, a, water, a large water main in that area that needs to be constructed. Uh, as well as the streetscape master plan that the city has developed is being implemented uh, on that stretch along with uh, this project. So that's quite a large uh, project that's being done in a collaborative uh, effort. And we currently have money in the budget for uh, next, uh, next year to start the, uh, the detailed design on that project. Hydro Canal Bridge North is the next project. That is the structure uh, close to Mini Putt there on uh, Highway 20. Um, that structure is in need of repair. There was some emergency repairs done on that a year ago on the one, uh, on the one uh, bearing seat. Uh, so that needs a full rehabilitation. And uh, we're working that into the plans with the rest of the Highway uh, 20 construction, on these lane construction to try to make sure that it all makes sense. And once again, this structure is also being coordinated with OPG as it goes over top of the canal that they're running the refurbishment project on. We currently have a construction year of this of 2021, uh, but there's some flexibility there to align it with uh, the rest of the initiatives that we have going on. Uh, the next two improvements that I'm going to speak about are uh, in the area of the proposed hospital <coughs> and, uh, on, in, uh, on Montrose and, and Creek Road. Um, so the first one is an actual improvement of the intersection of Lions Creek Road at Montrose. And we have funds in the forecast uh, for 2022 to cons complete construction there. But we're also wrapping that intersection up into a full-blown EA that we're going to run on Montrose Road from Creek Road all the way back to Canadian Drive to look at road needs uh, and improvements that may be driven uh, by the enhancements and, and addition of a hospital in West Niagara. So... Um, this is good news for the city that we, we are uh, looking forward, uh, understanding all the development that's happening in this area and trying to make sure that our, our look on this area is a holistic look to make sure that we cover all the needs. Uh, next improvement we have is Sodom Road from Lions Creek to Willick. Uh, we have design um, scheduled in our forecast for 2022 and construction in 2025 for this stretch which will include platform upgrades, likely urbanization of that area, uh, including some illumination upgrades. Next project, Stanley Avenue Bridge. So this is the section of Stanley Avenue south of uh, McLeod Road, uh, the large structure close to Oakland's golf course that runs over <coughs> top of the uh, Welland River. Um, that has uh, money, um, estimated in 2024 uh, for the design and the actual construction is in our 10-year forecast. It's not an immediate need, but it is a structure that requires some work in the near future. Uh, two structures that require work in the general area of downtown are uh, two bridge structures, Ontario a Avenue over the 420. Um, so that bridge is, is due for some work. We have design scheduled for 2024, and once again, the actual construction is in our 10-year forecast. And the other structure is Victoria Avenue structure over the 420, which is also uh, scheduled for 2024 for construction, and uh, we'll also be looking at a couple of other projects in that general area that are running through the EA process right now, but both of those structures will be getting work in the near future. Next section that we have is McLeod Road, and that's phase three. So this would be from Wilson Crescent to Stanley Avenue. 
If you think back four or five years, you'll remember that we resurfaced that section in front of Canadian Tire, uh, heading down towards uh, Stanley. Uh, we thought that the road section could get a little bit more life out of the current pavement, so we resurfaced it. But we do have a, an overall project in here to do a reconstruction of that full section, which will, at the end of the day, finish off all of uh, the regional portion of, of McLeod Road. So that's in our 10-year forecast. Uh, the next section that we have is Town Line Road from McLeod to Lundy's Lane. This is a rural section of road. We uh, did some rehabilitation work to it a, a few years back. Uh, however, it needs a larger rehabilitation um, to bring that road back up to standard. So we do have that in the forecast. Uh, it's looking like it's a construction year of 2027 right now, uh, but it is on our radar as something that needs some work. Uh, next project is Stanley Avenue from the 420 to Ferry Street. So that's a uh, five lane cross section. The city currently has some infrastructure needs in that area with respect to water mains. So we'll be coordinating with city staff to determine whether we do a joint project or whether the city goes first with their water main upgrades and then we do rehabilitation in that area afterwards. So we are tying that together with city work and uh, we're, we're kind of letting the city drive when we do that project because the road uh, surface itself is still in, in good shape. When we do go ahead and do this project, we will be including a lot of geometry upgrades on all the side streets. Uh, as you're aware, this is one section of road that in the summertime is very hard to get in off the side streets. So we'll be looking at uh, any improvements that we can with respect to active transportation, pedestrians, and overall geometry improvements to that section of road. I'll pass it back over to Carolyn. Thank you, Frank. So um, just to highlight, you can see the major investment that the region obviously is prioritizing works that are going to be done here in Niagara Falls. But just before closing, there's just a couple of things that are going to be affecting all the different municipalities that are going to be coming forward to the Public Works Committee in July. Um, they have to do with safety initiatives. Uh, we're looking to bring a Vision Zero program into the region that deals with um, a red light camera program, community safety zones, as well as automated speed enforcement. So we'll be partnering and working with each of the municipalities, obviously, to understand what those impacts may be. Um, and we'll work in partnership and just how we're going to be rolling those out. So those are some of the things just generally that we're going to be coming to the region that we wanted, um, obviously, all the different municipalities to hear about uh, from transportation as we move that forward. A couple other things, uh, regional wayfinding is another um, RFP that's going to be coming out as well as our complete streets. So we're going to be looking at different ways on how we're going to be delineating obviously the regional roads across the different typologies that have come out of our transportation master plan. And what I mean by typologies is I mean, for example, rural, urban, what the cross sections would look, will look like there. And when those RFPs are rolled out, we will put together a stakeholders uh, working group with each of the municipalities. So we'll have representatives from the municipalities as well as the region so that we're working together collaborati uh, collaboratively on what these cross sections and wayfinding programs will look like so that there'll be consistency in how we may be rolling them out across the region. So we just wanted to say thank you for having us here this evening. Um, there's major investment being done on behalf of the region. We enjoy our partnership and look forward to working continually with the staff here. And we just want to say thanks for having us this evening. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> Carolyn and uh, uh, Frank, we do have uh, some questions of council. I saw Councillor Cario had his hand up. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. And thank you for the investment in Niagara. Um, one of the streets that I get the most complaints about mm -hmm. is that McLeod Road section mm -hmm. from Dorchester, going uh, east. East. The one that, that was repaired right in front of Canadian Tire, it's in terrible shape. So when was that scheduled for, when was that gonna be reconstructed? Uh, I believe that one is in, I think we have that in 2027 right now. Yeah, if you, yeah, that, that one's, I don't know about the rest of the council, but that one I get the most complaints of. It was done, but mm -hmm. it deteriorated very quickly from that repair. And I don't know whether or not the street was cut mm -hmm. to repair underground services or what. Mm -hmm. but we'll, take, we'll take it back. We'll take it back and we'll take a look at it. Extremely bad. Mm -hmm. Okay, anyway, great. That was my question. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Well. I've got Councillor Peter Angelo, then the Coco. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Worship. Um, through you to Ms. Rall and Mr. Tisson. thanks very much for coming here. Um, are you sure that it was in 2027? I know I saw it on the one to five year capital. Yeah, and I know let me, it said let me, let me from, just uh, let me just double check. From the Queen Elizabeth Way, I think, or from the Hydro Canal all the way to Wilson Crescent. Wilson would be almost down by Drummond, I think. 
So that would encompass the front of uh, Canadian Tiger Food Basics. I, I think it was one of your very first slides. Mm -hmm. um, if you go to uh, the very first picture that you had on there, I thought it said uh, phase two is a road widening from the Hydro Canal to Wilson yeah, that, Crescent. Yeah, that's correct. To Wilson Crescent is being done in 2021-22 area, correct? 21-22? Yeah, it's from Wilson Crescent down to Stanley. That would be following that. That would be following that. Correct. And down in 27. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's great, actually, because I agree with Councilor Carrio. That's a section that we get complaints about all the time. And I know just in driving in that area, it's very, um, it's very slow moving. Um, one of the questions that I had was about that area as well. Now, you, it said that you're going to be widening the road. What is the road widening going to look like? And are you going to have? Are you going to continue forward with? Um, I guess the mandate that you have <coughs> in terms of putting bike lanes every time that you're road widening. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So three, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yes, we are continuing with that philosophy uh, on all of our regional projects where we have the ability to add cycling facilities and, okay. and enhance the active transportation realm. We are doing that. Um, if you've been down there in the last week, you'll notice that we did do a resurfacing on that section. We know that there's a lot of development happening in the area, and with the uh, OPG canal refurbishment, um, we are trying to slot that project in at the best time. Um, so we, we did do some interim upgrades there in case it's a few years before we get out there. Um, but yes, we are carrying that sentiment through and we'll be continuing that all the way down. I don't anticipate that you're going to see a, a, a drastic uh, change in the part that's already a four lane cross section from Dorchester to the east, mm -hmm. but you'll definitely see uh, some upgrades from the canal to Dorchester <coughs> that will carry that cross section through and help to flush traffic through. Yeah, and, and, and I just wanna say, Your Worship, that's great news really. Um, I think active transportation is very important. I know I've talked many times about uh, you know creating an actual rectangle or just anything that we can move around and uh, and providing some connectivity for bike lanes. So appreciate the information. Thanks very much. You know, and especially uh, the overpass that the MTO constructed <coughs> has bike lanes, mm -hmm. and then as it goes east, yes. there's no bike lanes. So it definitely makes things a little bit of a traffic jam, and it's a crazy busy. Good news. Yeah, it's very good news. Mm -hmm. Councilor Coco. Through the mayor to the speaker, you spoke about uh, refurbishing the hydro canals, and I was wondering if you're looking at putting barriers on them. I know there was a request a while ago to put up some barriers for the loss of lives there. I was wondering if you could speak on that. I can answer that one. Uh, mm -hmm. We met with OPG, mm -hmm. and OPG is going to be in the process of putting barriers up, and that's one of the locations that they identified. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Any other questions of council for our presenters? So look for a motion to receive the report. Moved by Councillor Cario, seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? Excellent. So thank you, Frank and Carolyn. Appreciate you coming out tonight. That thank was you. very informative, very helpful, and we should do this more often. For sure. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you don't get a board. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Adam, six point four. Oni. Uh, Oniara Kara Aspiring Global <coughs> Geopark. We've got Darren Platicus here, acting chair, who's going to address council, along with Phil Davis, Indigenous Culture Liaison, and you'll be presenting to council about the Aspiring Global Geopark project. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, council, staff, and uh, those seated in the gallery. Um, as mentioned, my name is Darren Platicus. I'm the founder and, <coughs> excuse me, CEO of Geospatial Niagara and acting chair of the Oneyakra Aspiring Global Geopark. Joining me today is uh, Phil Davis, our Indigenous Cultural Liaison. Uh, Mr. Ian Lucas sends his regrets. He's on vacation after spending a ton of money on his daughter's wedding this past <coughs> weekend. <coughs> so, <coughs> would you like to say a few words? Yes. Sego, Scano, Tanzi, Bujo. Hi. Uh, my name is Phil Davis. I'm a Ganya Gahage of the Haudenosaunee peoples, and, and I'm happy to be here with you on, on behalf of Oneagra. Oneagra is a Mohawk word that was used to formulate the word Niagara uh, many, many years ago. Uh, it means the neck between the two bodies of water. It shows up there between Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. 
And what we're going to share with you, in, in my perspective, ties into a lot to what we, we call our Thanksgiving address. And our Thanksgiving address talks about the importance of who we are as human beings on this planet and what our, what our, what our responsibilities are especially towards Mother Earth, because it's Mother Earth that provides all of us with what we have. If it wasn't for Mother Earth, none of what we do as human beings would be allowed to carry on. You know, so I'd like to share that with you, but I'm going to share it in a, in a, in a short uh, English version, adopted from one of our uh, scholars from uh, Ghana Satage, out towards Montreal. And it says, uh, we give greetings, love, respect, to the peoples of the earth where the human beings dwell, to the streams and the pools and the lakes, the corns, the fruits, and the medicines, to the trees and the forest for their usefulness, to the animals that provide us with pelts and give them themselves for sustenance with food, to the greater winds and the lesser ones, to our eldest brother, the sun, her grandmother, the moon, to our mighty warrior, messenger of creator and to the messengers of creator who reveal his wishes to us and to creator who is the ruler of health and life thank you that is the basis of how we say that the words before all else when we conduct our business uh, through through our through our confederacy as the Haudenosaunee peoples. And again, it's said at the beginning and it's said at the end to remind us that when we do our business, that we still have to pay stewardship to our mother, the earth. Because if we don't do that, then something's going to become amiss and we're going to have to pay for that as human beings. And to me, that's what this, this is the basis of this project and this philosophy is to, is to help encourage stewardship throughout the Niagara region and to give us all that, that sense of, yes, we all belong together in this, and we need, to, we need to do things in a good way so that the future generations beyond, beyond us <coughs> will have a future, and we'll have trees, and we'll have clean water, you know, and we'll have, be able to sustain themselves as we do today. So, you know, we'll go. thank you very much. So we are here to provide a Coles Notes version <laughs> about what UNESCO geoparks are and more specifically about the Oneyakra Aspiring Global Geopark Project. By the end of the presentation, we are seeking the endorsement of the Oneyakra Aspiring Global Geopark as we gather uh, support across the Niagara region through the application process. So what is a geopark? So the UNESCO designation of a global geopark is a unified geographical area with geology of international significance. But geoparks aren't solely about the geology, but rather how that geology has impacted the culture and the industry of the areas in which they are located. They're a bottom-up approach of combining conservation with sustainable economic development while involving local communities, and they are becoming increasingly popular uh, globally. They are living, working landscapes with exceptional geological heritage where science and local communities engage in a mutually beneficial way. Perhaps my favorite quote is from a gentleman by the name of Patrick McKeever, uh, formerly of UNESCO, who came to visit us in Oneyakra uh, on the Victoria Day weekend. And um, his quote is, uh, geoparks are those special places around the world that not only tell part of the history of the planet, but also celebrate how our geological heritage is linked with other types of heritage. And this forms the basis of community empowerment and the promotion of the area's sustainable economic development. There are over 140 designated UNESCO Global Geoparks around the world. Uh, three of them are currently in Canada. Uh, Stonehammer Global Geopark, uh, the picture at the bottom left, uh, was the first global geopark in Canada in 2010. That was followed by Tumblr Ridge, uh, the picture on the right, in 2014, and the most recent one is Per Se, Quebec in 2018. There are two other global geoparks on the horizon for Canada. One is the Discovery Global Geopark in Bonavista, Newfoundland, and the second would be Eclipse of Fundy Aspiring Global Geopark in uh, 
centered on Parsboro and Nova Scotia, actually. In addition to Oneyagra, there are six other aspiring global geoparks across Canada. There are two others aspiring geoparks in Ontario. One is uh, the Big Impact Global Geopark in Sudbury and the uh, Temiskaming Rift Valley uh, on the border of Quebec and <coughs> Ontario. Each and every global geopark strives to incorporate and promote the global geoparks pillars within their respective geopark management plans. Uh, these include education, sustainable, responsible tourism, cultural awareness, and geoconservation and geotourism. There is an emphasis on increasing the lengths of stays um, within Niagara, uh, promoting indigenous and nature-based non-traditional forms of tourism. So why Niagara? UNESCO encourages cooperation with existing UNESCO designations, such as our World Biosphere Reserve, building upon relationships across Canada and around the world, sharing best practices and other forms of research and programs. Promotion and education as it relates to culture is, is particularly important in the establishment of a UNESCO Global Geopark, especially for our local Indigenous communities, but also for other cultures that now call Niagara home. Did you want to add anything? The escarpment in Niagara has driven our earliest industry and provides the perfect climate making us Canada's fruit belt. Our wines are world renowned and our craft beers and spirits are increasing in popularity. The Welland Canal exists because of the escarpment and the stone for the construction of our historic canal locks and also for the construction of our most prominent buildings came from the Niagara escarpment. From farmers markets to hiking and cycling, Niagara is more than the typical tourist seas, and we are fast becoming a four season experience destination. Niagara is also on the forefront of research in agriculture, sustainability, and a host of other disciplines that are prominent in other UNESCO global geoparks. In designation, we provide another incentive for our post secondary institutions to attract masters and postdoctoral candidates. So, the obvious attraction in Niagara Falls is Niagara Falls. And I had the privilege of doing a flyover when uh, Mr. McKeever was here for his visit. But you also, <coughs> excuse me, you also have gems in the making like the Toronto Power Generating Station. <coughs> you have the Whitewater Walk, Whirlpool Jet Boats, Niagara Glen Nature Center, the zip line, and the Niagara Tunnel Project, which is an incredible educational opportunity um, to explain our geology, uh, sustainability, renewable energies, and how Niagara has impacted our industry. You also have beautiful hiking areas like Heartland Forest, but also some very significant historical locations such as Lundy's Lane. The application dossier uh, consists of a uh, formal self-evaluation. You submit an application to the uh, Canadian uh, UNESCO committee. They send two evaluators here to Niagara um, to sort of vet our application and verify it. It's updated with recommendations and we, were, we would be operational as a global geopark for the period of one year, at which time um, the final uh, submission to UNESCO would take place. And again, they would come and review as well. And then we would get our designation. We're aiming somewhere around 2023, 2024. Some of our awareness and promotional opportunities that are upcoming are the, uh, for 2020s, the 10th International Cool Climate Wine Symposium. We all uh, have the uh, Canada Summer Games in 2021. There is a total solar eclipse in 2024. And if you're familiar with the last total solar eclipse, that came by last February um, that transected the United States. People from the periphery of that transect actually flocked to that center um, and it basically increased tourism all along that path of the uh, total solar eclipse. And that path is going directly across Niagara in 2024. It's in April, so the weather could be kind of dicey, but we could still pr use it as a promotional opportunity. And of course, the most recent announced uh, 2026 World Cup that's being played in Toronto. So in conclusion, the Oneyaka Aspiring Global Geopark is an opportunity for all of Niagara to work together to promote what makes our communities and region unique 
among the other UNESCO global geoparks. <coughs> to educate ourselves and the world about the region humanity has called home for about 12,000 years, we are truly unique from the ground up. And here are some of our local uh, sponsors and supporters. And if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Darren and Phil. Do we have any questions of council uh, for our presenters? Okay, I guess it was a great job. Uh, really covered things nicely. Yes, Councillor Thompson. Yeah, I had, uh, thank you for your presentation. And uh, uh, if you're looking for uh, natural parks and uh, environment, I think you're in the right place with Niagara Falls. And tying that into tourism is uh, very appropriate. I had the opportunity to sit and listen to my colleague uh, who was with you tonight uh, a week ago and uh, told me about your plans and being at council. I think this is uh, very appropriate and fits in with what we're all about here in Niagara Falls. And I would move that we refer this to staff to move it forward and see if we can uh, become part of your partnership. Thank you. Yeah, and I met with uh, Mike as well and he helped to kind of lay down the groundwork ahead of time, which was really helpful. So, okay, so we've got a motion by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Peter Angelo, that we refer this to staff and receive the presentation all at the same time. We'll call the vote, all those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. So gentlemen, thank you very much for coming out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up, Positive Living Niagara. We've got Jackie Barrett-Green. Is Jackie here? Okay, great. Manager of Education Support and Volunteer Services. And Wendy Matthews, Coordinator of Volunteer Services from Positive Living Niagara. They're gonna give us a presentation on the Red Scarf Project. So welcome. Thank you for having us. Um, well, we're here to ask you to join us for International AIDS Awareness Day. Um, so Positive Living Niagara, first off I just want to let you know that we're an a uh, HIV service organization. Uh, next year will be our 30th year in operation in the Niagara region. So we provide support, education, counseling to people living with HIV. We have about 120 Niagara residents living with <coughs> HIV. Um, we also provide um, the Streetworks Needle Exchange, the Safe Fit Injection Site, uh, education. We have four uh, specialty educators who go out and speak to populations most at risk for HIV. Um, we uh, serve the entire Niagara region. And one of our big projects every year is International AIDS Awareness Day. So that's December 1st across the world. Um, and in Niagara, that awareness starts a week before, and we kick off the project with the Red Scarf Project. So what we have done is, um, with generous donations from the casinos in Niagara, they've been very, uh, very generous in helping us pay for wool, um, and we have a ton of knitters, knitting scarves, and what we've done in the last few years is we've taken St. Paul Street and St. Catharines and blanketed the street in red scarves a week before World AIDS Day. And these are the scarves. They have little tags that say you found me and a little bit of information about HIV and who we are. And people are welcome then to come along and take the scarves. Um, so we, we have had a very successful few years in St. Catharines and because we're a regional agency we want to expand that and our next logical choice is Niagara Falls so we would like to bring the Red Scarf project to Niagara Falls and I will let Wendy describe exactly what that means all right the next slide or there we go Oh, yeah, I think next we're on one. the next one. <coughs> Perfect. <laughs> so the AIDS Awareness Day kicks off with a flag raising at our city hall and it precedes by the um, Red Scarf event. Next slide. Um, the flag raising is officiated by the mayor and it's joined by staff, volunteers, our knitters, our crocheters, our supporters, the public. And last year we had over 50 in attendance just at our flag raising. Next one. 
Uh, the Red Scarf Project started about five years ago with a very small amount of hand-knitted scarves and it has grown over these five years. And um, the scarves, as Jackie mentioned, are um, attached with a hang tag. It has a little bit of information about HIV. It also says, hey, you found me. Keep me to keep warm. So these scarves are, um, it talks a little bit more about HIV. Um, so following the flag raising, we asked the participants that come out to it to join us to walk down the street. Um, there they pick up handfuls of, of scarves and we tie the street literally um, from trees to poles to meters. And again. At the end of, that, of our red scarf journey, we end up at a reception that's close to the street and that from there we enjoy some hot chocolate and some cake and we chat with our fellow participants. So our request is um, Niagara Falls is to be able to hold this event again in Niagara Falls as well this year um, to have the flag raising on November 28th, have the mayor or his representative to officiate the event uh, to hold the Red Scarf Project down Queen Street in Niagara Falls on the same day and as well for everybody to join us on November 28th. One of the things that was notable last year, we had several um, tourists, uh, I remember one in particular from Australia, um, wrote to us saying they found the scarves and sent us yes. a, a donation. They were just so thrilled to see such a display of unity and how pretty it was. <laughs> the whole street was uh, red. It doesn't last long because no. people are coming by taking the scarves. Uh, With under two hours, it is clear. It's clear. <laughs> <laughs> but for those two hours, it's really pretty. Yeah. <laughs> so do we have any questions of council for the ladies doing the presentation here today? Councillor Strange. Yeah, I just want to thank you ladies for the great uh, presentation and uh, hopefully we can bring this to Niagara Falls and I'm willing to make that motion and get that sea of red scarves around wherever the event may be, whether it be Queen Street or City Hall or whatever it is. So I'd love to make the motion to, to All right, so that. we've got a motion by Councillor Strange, seconded by Councillor Campbell that the 28th of yep. November be flag raising Positive Living Niagara Day and we'll do all the festivities that you spoke of here today. So we've got the motion seconded. We'll call the vote, all those in favor. And that's unanimously supported by this council. So we're looking, gonna look forward to the 28th of November and knitting the town red. <laughs> Thank, you Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Okay, for those following along in the agenda, we're at 6.6. .6. It's the Bickles Hardware and Supply <laughs> Deputation and Proclamation Request and I invite up Dino Fazio to speak of the 100th anniversary of Bickles. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. I'm here with Rick Tisi, who is the chair of the uh, Main and Ferry Street BIA. So we'll start off and then he'll pass it on to me. So I'm here to um, ask on behalf of the BIA for a waiver of road closure fees for the upcoming event. Uh, the Main and Ferry BIA wishes to host a street festival to spotlight and showcase one of our long-standing members, uh, Bickles Hardware. Uh, Bickles Main Industrial Supply is the proper name, um, in celebration of their 100th anniversary on Saturday, August 24th. It'll be held along Main Street from Ferry to Pier. Um, and Dino, again, is the event manager. I'll go over some of the details of this. There we go. All right. So as Rick mentioned, uh, we're here to discuss the BIA's desire to spotlight and showcase a prominent BIA member who's <coughs> celebrating its 100th anniversary, and in so doing, also shine a light on the ongoing revitalization of the Main and Ferry Street areas. With the pending revitalization of the Farmer's Market and the new Cultural Hub, this is the first event in many years designed for the residents and visitors to explore one of the most historic districts in the city, Historic Drummondville. Oops, wrong way. I'll get it. All right, so this evening we will briefly discuss the 100th anniversary celebrations of Bickles Hardware, which is taking place on Saturday, August 24th, along Main Street and Niagara Falls, between Ferry Street and Pier Street. The Rain and Shine event will run from 11 a.m. until 5 p.m. that day, and will feature product uh, displays and demonstrations 
from over 25 vendors coming to Niagara Falls from across North America. Uh, the map is a little, little uh, small here, but uh, hit it again. No, I don't think we had to close that. Anyway, so up top here is the uh, ferry and Main Street intersection. Below here is the uh, Pier Street and the Main Street intersection. So all along Main Street, we'll have vendor booths uh, set up. We'll also have here across from Bibbles Hardware our stage with live music, and we'll be using that for the grand unveiling of the new uh, landmark signature Bickle signature display. Next to that, we'll have the 2019 Toyota mm -hmm. Tundra. Uh, as well, next to that, the truck area for Bosch Tools, which is be our uh, major event sponsor. In the park area is where we'll have our food trucks, uh, our porta potties, uh, and also we're hoping to have a 14-foot replica photo op display uh, for people to take some fantastic pictures within the area as well. So whether you're a commercial, large commercial contractor, or a small DIY, or anybody in between, you're not going to want to miss this event. It's a once-in-a-century event with once-in-a-century pricing. Um, in fact, Mr. Todd, Ken, if, if the city's looking to be getting anything from protective gear to safety gear, power tools, hand tools, they're going to want to be here. Um, from saw blades, like I said, from saw blades to drill bits, abrasives to protective gear, electric power tools to the highest quality hand tools, all will be available that day as well as, as I said earlier, the entire lineup of products from Bosch, our main event sponsor, uh, as well as others like Makita and Norton. Basically, we're inviting the public to come out and join us for the first open house in the history of Bickles Hardware. Besides the product vendors, we're going to have lots of other exciting things happening going on that day. As I said earlier, food trucks, car displays, historic walking tours of the War of 1812 battlefield, robotics demonstrations, an appearance by the T-800 Terminator robot, um, as well as live music and so much, much more, including the chance for residents to win a 2019 Toyota Tundra, trailer not included, uh, but you have to be there for that day uh, to get a ballot, or if you're listening to Hits FM, you might have a chance to win a golden ticket. As well, that afternoon, we will be unveiling I uh, have the grand unveiling of the new Bickles signature hard, uh, sorry, the new Bickles signature landmark display. Uh, just a little teaser image here, don't want to tell you, show off too much about that. But the, um, the piece of public art symbolizes the working shoulder to shoulder model of Bickles hardware and in fact of the main ferry area, the traditional and historic cultural and business hub of the community. So we are now just beginning the promotional aspects of the event. Uh, starting next week, you'll see light post banner displays uh, located throughout the uh, BIA district. As well, later this week, uh, billboard, radio, print, and digital advertising will begin for the event as well. In its 100-year history, uh, Bickles Hardware has helped build massive projects uh, across southern Ontario, everything from the Welland Canal to the Garden City Skyway. Uh, but it has also helped build careers through internships and student, bur student bursaries. So in honor of its 100 years in business, Bickles Hardware will be contributing a minimum of $2,500 towards local high school trades program bursaries and will further donate the uh, waived road closure fees uh, towards that as well. So in a nutshell, it is the Bickles 100th anniversary celebration on Saturday, August 24th from 11 to 5 p.m. along Main Street, Niagara Falls, between Ferry and uh, Pier Streets. Once in a century product displays uh, once uh, uh, on top brand names, product displays and demonstrations, food trucks, live music, car displays, family friendly activities and fun demonstrations, the grand unveiling of the new Bickles hardware signature landmark display, the chance to win a 2019 Toyota Tundra. Basically, it's tools, food, and fun for everyone, and we invite the entire community to join us that day. So we thank you. If you have any questions, or you would like to make the motion, by all means. All right, I've so got, uh, I've got Councillor Thompson, <laughs> Cario, Dabrowski, of course, all the men who like their tools want to talk, right? So, <laughs> Councillor Thompson. <laughs> anyway, uh, good presentation, but uh, when you've been around for a long time and you had the opportunity to go in to Bickles Hardware and meet him personally for many, many years, 
I think he was working there until he was in his 90s, uh, Mr. Bickle himself. Uh, he was a fascinating and a great businessman. But uh, I see uh, in your presentation there was something you couldn't really see there, but I have seen it and I have had my picture taken with all of the men sitting inside there. I guess you don't want me to say anything. Not about just yet. That. Not just yet. <laughs> Not <surprised>. just yet. <laughs> <laughs> but this is going to be, without exception, the most fascinating uh, thing to happen probably not only in uh, Main Street, but in any business area, probably in Ontario. Mr. Uh, DeCaria, who operates it now, uh, is gonna put a front on his uh, Bickle hardware that is gonna be unbelievable. Uh, it was extremely costly, uh, and he's had it there for a couple of years, waiting for the time for all of this to happen. So it gives me a great deal of pleasure to move the motion for approval for this event and uh, to congratulate uh, uh, Mr. Bickle and Mr. DeCaria for what they're doing uh, for the future. So my pleasure to do that. Thank you. Okay, so motion by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Cario. And what a coincidence that the mayor that cut the ribbon on the opening of Beckles is here to make this motion 100 years later. What an incredible coincidence. <laughs> Councillor Cario, did you want to say I'll something? i just make a couple of comments. <coughs> the, the storefront at Beckles is so deceiving. Unless you had any dealings with Beckles, you really had no idea what Beckles were, was. Uh, Henry Beckles was a fabulous guy. Uh, anyone that had uh, any companies in Niagara, any manufacturing companies, industrial companies, contractors, uh, Mr. Bickle was their partner. He got them whatever they needed, no matter what it was. Uh, he could find anything anywhere in the world. If you needed a part, whether it was a valve or a gear, or, you'd go see Mr. Bickle, and he would find it. Not only would he find it, but he'd find it at the best price yeah. that you could find. You could go look elsewhere. You'd never find it on a better deal than Mr. Bickle would offer. And uh, he worked well with all the industry. Uh, everyone thought of Mr. Bickle as a friend, and I'm, I'm happy and proud to uh, say we were very close to Mr. Bickle. Worked with Bickles from when I was a very little kid. Went down to Bickles with my dad and bought nuts and bolts and tools and everything and, and got to know Mr. Bickle. Great guy, happy to be part of the celebration. We appreciate that, we certainly do. And, and just so you're aware, in its 100 year history, there has only been three owners. The current owner, Mr. DeCaria, has been, in fact, working there for the last 30 years. Yeah. So it's been quite a tradition Paul, that way. Paul's, yeah. there for Paul's still there. Yeah. 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 He's the ghost that comes at the building. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got Councillor Dabrowski as well. Yeah, great presentation. Uh, congratulations. 100 years, I, I can only imagine running a business for, for that many years. Uh, a ton of history in the building, as Councillor Carrier said. My father as well worked at ABC Rail um, throughout the past 20 or 30 years. Uh, in the mid 80s and 90s and he had some great stories to tell as well so i'm all for uh, outdoor events pray to uh, the weather gods but kudos to you guys congratulations and, and thank you for the presentation thank you okay thank you for that so we have a motion that is making the month of august bickle's 100th anniversary month as well we're giving approval for road closure permits and associated fees that'll be waived as well for main street between ferry and pier do we have everything covered Yes, sir. Okay, so we, you've heard the motion. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? And it's clearly unanimous, so we're really looking forward to it. We appreciate it very much. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, our last presentation before we get, in, get into our planning matter is the Ontario Water Power Association. So we've got Stephanie Landers here, the Manager of Community Relations and Public Outreach is going to speak to council. Welcome. Welcome, thank you. Uh, Mayor, councillors and staff, thank you for having me today. Uh, as mentioned, I'm with the Ontario Water Power Association. It's actually OWA for short. We are based out of Peterborough, Ontario, and we are a member-based industry trade association with about 150 members, a uh, few of which are within your community, including Hatch and Ontario Power Generation. Uh, the reason why I'm here today is uh, we have a couple asks for the council, one of which is um, 
signing our Ontario Water Power Champions Charter, as well as proclaiming Water Power Day on June 20th. I've been to many councils throughout the last month and a bit, and the city of Peterborough, city of Cortha Lakes, uh, city of Kingston, uh, Trent Hills, and Quinty West have all proclaimed Water Power Day. It was last week, our inaugural uh, event, and it was held actually in Niagara Falls. Uh, it, it was held with the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources, Ontario Power Generation, and uh, OW, OWA. And finally, we ask that you connect with us uh, uh, in the future if you have any questions about water power itself. I'm going to, going to do a brief presentation about uh, water power within Ontario, and I will make it quick because I do have a quick two-minute video that I'd like to show you uh, that showcases our members and why we hope that you will celebrate Water Power Day. Within Ontario, there's 224 facilities. Uh, Niagara Falls is certainly the one that Ontarians know the best. Whenever I'm within the community, they mention Niagara Falls. I said, yes, that's certainly a water power facility, but they are all over the place in the north, south, east, and west. They're extremely diverse in terms of age, in terms of size. Uh, they can range from one kilowatt, which actually in your book, your community guide here on page seven, you'll see a backyard water power facility and as well as Niagara Falls, uh, which is uh, the Sir Adam Beck facility, which I'll discuss as well. Uh, and uh, in terms of something that's very important as well, it's extremely affordable. So uh, something that was of importance to residents within Ontario is affordability within the electricity system. And we pride ourselves on being the lowest cost. Uh, on that note, we did do some public outreach opinion polling last year in 2018 with a third party uh, organization called Oracle Poll. What we discovered, we were quite happy to find out that 92% of Ontario residents support water power. That was across all demographics, so whether uh, whatever age you were, what uh, region you lived in, whether you were rural, urban, as well as political affiliation. So within the city of Niagara Falls, I'm sure you're well aware, uh, there are two water power facilities, significantly large facilities, on the, on, they're the largest facilities in the province, uh, Sir Adam Beck and Sir Adam Beck Pumping Generating Station. So uh, the reason why we've picked June 20th is it's uh, Sir Adam Beck's birthday. So we thought it was very appropriate to have uh, June 20th as our annual water power day. And certainly we view your community as a water power champion. Uh, we're basically seeing a political uh, movement towards local land use planning within the province. So we anticipate uh, there will be opportunities in the future for retrofitting existing assets, uh, which you have seen within your own community. Uh, additionally, there are 2,000 dams within the province that do not currently provide hydroelectricity. Those dams are used for flood mitigation or navigation, uh, different purposes. However, um, when we refurbish could be used for uh, water power production. Uh, as well as communities are trying to be more sustainable and, and looking at uh, economic opportunities in the future, we certainly hope that uh, municipalities consider water power as something that they can use as an economic, economic opportunity and sustainable opportunity as well. Uh, the Water Power Champions Charter is on page five of your community guide. And uh, it's basically a commitment to the expansion of water power within your community. Uh, taking advantage of infrastructure refurbishment opportunities, enhancing uh, natural environments as well as man-made uh, environments as you see here at Niagara Falls, uh, valuing all the voices within your community, and then finally working collaboratively to create opportunities as well. Uh, just before we uh, do questions, I'd like to do that quick two-minute video if you don't mind, uh, and then uh, happy to answer any questions that you may have. Ontario has a rich diversity of water power facilities. Given the unique characteristics of the surroundings, the river flow, the hydrology, they all differ in their structures, the technology, the size of the units, the dams depending on the topography and the size of the river and watershed. This plant, for example, has uh, got a unique feature with the, uh, the wing wall here. Uh, whether they're just producing electricity as energy or voltage support, 
This facility is rather unique. Uh, you've got over 100 years of technology between two plants. That powers about 7,500 homes in this community. I think water power supports the local communities by supplying affordable, reliable and sustainable power for many, many years. We assist with uh, public safety, uh, flood control, uh, producing green energy for the local area. Water power's importance for the future is a hundred year old question that still rings true today. Look at what we're experiencing uh, with climate change issues. Water power is a great source of green energy. We need to utilize uh, low carbon, low pollution energy solutions into the future and hydropower does that. Every day as our facilities produce green energy uh, that's fighting climate change. I think it's important to celebrate Water Power Day, particularly because uh, water power is the first renewable energy uh, resource. It's an opportunity for us that are in the industry to, uh, to educate the public and uh, share the successes that, uh, that we have as an industry. Uh, recognition of these facilities, recognition of the people who have built them, the people who work here, uh, and what they've contributed to our society in the last century. And certainly in this region, we have an abundance of water, and it's, uh, I think there's a great future in hydropower, and we need to explore that more. That's great. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions of council for Stephanie? Okay, seeing none, so we're looking for a motion. Now, I know the date's already passed. Yes, we're hoping annually to celebrate uh, on June 20th. Okay, yeah. so um, so then we're, so we could still call it <laughs> June 20th uh, this past year, because it says 2019 here, um, that we're gonna call it uh, Water Power Day. Is that right? Yes. And was there another? Um, Signing the charter, the this? Ontario Water Power Champions Charter. Okay. So we've got a request by Stephanie for those two things that we proclaim June 20th Water Power Day, then we sign the charter. Moved by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Dabrowski. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved unanimously. Thank you Thank very you. much. Have a great day. Thanks, you too. Now, ladies and gentlemen, um, I understand there's a number of people in the gallery for item 10.4. Um, so if I could get a motion of council to move that forward, it should be very quickly dealt with. Uh, Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? Okay, and that item 10.4 is the issuance of cannabis licenses in residentially zoned areas. So what we've received here is um, some correspondence from the town of Fort Erie. And basically, they passed this resolution, and I'll, it's just three lines, I'll read it. Uh, first, that council requests the federal government to provide information on all cannabis licenses, including personal medical licenses to the town when licenses are issued. Further, that a public process take place in connection with granting cannabis licenses, licenses and their location. And further, the resolution be circulated to the Prime Minister, Minister of Health, the area MPs, and all of Ontario municipalities. So, um, the, the suggestion is that it's for information, but I don't know if there was any dialogue other than that. Councillor Lacoco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The feedback that I got from some people is that the government doesn't require you to license if you have your four plants for recreational. Why would it be licensed if you have medicinal? Because the government doesn't make the municipality have a list of all of your medication. I'll put that out for discussion. Okay, yeah, Councillor Campbell. Yes, uh, thank you, Your Honor. If I read this correctly, if, if someone in Fort Erie has a, a medical license to use cannabis, they're asking for that identification of that person. Is that what this is saying? Help me out, uh, legal. <laughs> I want to make sure it's a term. I think that is what I think that's what they're asking for. Well, then uh, why don't we expand it and we'll ask for everybody takes aspirins or uh, <laughs> sleeping pills or uh, Ritalin, for example. Yeah. God, I'd like to know how many people in Niagara Falls take Ritalin. This, I can't, I, I can't support this. Okay. 
Well, if there's no further discussion around it, we're looking for okay. Motion by Councillor Campbell to receive and file. Second by Councillor Dabrowski. Uh, if there's no, uh, yeah, Councillor Peter Angelo. I don't think we know much about it, but that's kind of what I read when I read it as well. Um, I, I, I think the concern comes from the fact that there really isn't any rules around what some of these uh, medical prescriptions that people have are. Uh, the government has allowed people to go out and, and grow four plants, but some people have prescriptions for upwards of 20 plants. So I think when people you know, wake up one day and they look outside and they see that someone has a backyard full of plants, they get concerned and want to know whether or not there's a license. I don't know how the government's going to handle it. I agree that they're not going to be passing over the medical notes, but uh, yeah. you know, perhaps, uh, perhaps we can support something else in the fact that the federal government at least decide whether or not, uh, you know, um, I don't know, something around the medical prescriptions. There has to be, uh, I would imagine, a limit for one person. Okay, well right now we've got a motion just to receive the resolution. So uh, we've, did you want to speak to it? Yep, oh, so, uh, we've already got it seconded, yep. So moved by Councillor Campbell, second by Councillor Dabrowski. Okay, we'll call the vote. What's that, do you want to speak to it? No, just after. Okay, we'll call the vote, all those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. So anyone that was here for that, we just received, we took no action on it, Mr. No, CAO. If I just may, I, I, I'm guessing most of those people are here for the interim control bylaw. That's correct. Uh, not that motion particularly, so I know that was interesting, but I, I would think it's, the, uh, I think it's the interim control bylaw. So I don't know, Mr. Mayor, if you want to just move that one bylaw forward now. If, okay, uh, can we get the number on? Okay. My intelligence isn't so intelligent. <laughs> All right, what, uh, what, I'm sorry? Okay, so motion by Councillor Cario, seconded by Councillor Pietrangelo to move uh, the interim control bylaw for the, metal, or for the marijuana grow, outdoor medical grow operations forward. It's 2019 76. 2019-76. We'll call the vote, all those in favor. Okay, so we're gonna deal with that issue now. Okay, second. so we've got a motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Cario to give the bylaw first, second, and third reading. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved? Yes. All right, so now have we dealt with everything? Mr. C. Table, Kathy. All right, yeah. so it's been approved unanimously, so thank you, and uh, thank you to the clerk for suggesting we move it forward so you don't have to wait around mm -hmm. for another hour or so. Thank you. <laughs> What's that? You don't have to leave. Oh no. <laughs> Hang out with us. This is fun. <laughs> okay, I now ask our clerk to introduce. We're just kidding, by the way, folks. But no, no pressure. None at all. I'd ask the clerk to introduce the next item on tonight's agenda. Public meeting is now being convened to consider proposed to consider proposed amendments to the city's official plan and zoning bylaw to permit single room occupancy units uh, within single room occupancy buildings or motels. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with the Planning Act on May 24th, 2019 and by posting an ad in the Niagara Falls Review on May 25th, 2019. Anyone who wants notice of the passing of the official plan and zoning bylaw amendment to participate in any site plan process if applicable or preserve their opportunity to appeal to the local planning appeal tribunal shall leave their name on the sign-in sheets outside the council chamber. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. I now ask our Director of Planning, Mr. Herlovich, to explain the purpose and reason for the proposed amendments. Okay, <laughs> excuse me. Thank you, Worship. Um, the good news is I don't have a PowerPoint tonight, so you don't have to deal with that. <laughs> the bad news is you still have to listen to me. Oh. <laughs> um, so this is a public meeting under the Planning Act to consider uh, an amendment to the uh, city's official plan and zoning bylaw. Um, in April of 2017, council passed an interim control bylaw to prohibit the establishment of any further boarding houses um, in the city. This was in response to a uh, application by a motel operator 
wishing to add a boarding house uh, to a block minor variance um, to the committee of adjustment. Um, tonight's uh, presentation really represents two years work in terms of studying uh, the issue of, um, of boarding houses in the commercial areas. Uh, and what was determined through that study is that while we called it a boarding house study, we found that the people who were living in motel units were not boarding there, but were actually living in the units as uh, single house housekeeping units. Uh, so it's quite different from people in the residential area who might be uh, living as a group and in a uh, boarding house situation. The, uh, so what the consultants concluded was that there would be a new land use category called single room <coughs> occupancy unit and single room occupancy building. Uh, the city hired uh, MHBC planning uh, to make a recommendation and they're recommending um, policies for the official plan. They're also introducing uh, regulations and provisions to deal with uh, zoning to regulate the new land use and they're also introducing um, new licensing provisions that would be used to, to regulate the operation of these particular uses. The uh, drafts of those documents are attached to the, uh, to the report before council and uh, the report was, or the uh, public meeting was uh, advertised in accordance with the Planning Act. During the uh, course of the study, as I said, it was determined that uh, two motels are actually operating in the same way and they're located outside of uh, the tourist commercial areas. One is at Valley Way and another on Montrose Road. So there are bylaws drafted that would recognize those two property sites specifically uh, outside of the commercial uh, area. And then the last would be uh, a property at 80, uh, 8004 Lundy's Lane, it's zoned R5C, um, and they are interested in also adding the single room occupancy unit use to their property, and that too was advertised as part of the meeting for tonight's council meeting. Um, I'd like to um, actually now turn this over to uh, our consultants, uh, Dana Anderson and Kelly Martell, <coughs> they're the uh, consultants with uh, MHBC consultants who actually did the study and uh, worked extensively with uh, social services, Lundy's Lane BIA, uh, the police services, um, and a number of other community groups to uh, bring this uh, study to conclusion staff is recommending that council adopt um, or approve the uh, boarding house study and that the official plan amendment, zoning bylaw amendment, and licensing uh, bylaw come back at a later council meeting. It suggested that could be July, but it will depend on the input that council receives tonight. So uh, Dana Anderson's at the podium and I'd, I'd like to invite her to um, brief council on the study. Okay, thank you, welcome. Thank you, Your Worship and members of council. Um, it's a pleasure to be here again this evening. As you will recall, we were here in November of last year presenting our initial findings and some recommendations. Um, this evening, I would like to go back and walk you through the process that we've undertaken in the past two years. The extent of that process, and I know in your council package you have a staff report as well as the draft documents, and I believe from the November meeting you would have the substantial background reports and analysis reports, which I have uh, copies available here as well. So thank you to the planning director for that introduction. I know you have a number of other items, so I will try and be brief. This is a very, I believe, important study, important recommendations for council to consider. And I'm certainly here and available to answer any uh, detailed questions. Um, we began this process, um, as Alex indicated, as a result of a Committee of Adjustment application uh, to pursue a minor variance to actually legalize the use that was being carried out at the Continental Inn, as you may remember. Um, and so it was through that process that I believe Council had a report before it to suggest that changes to the land use to regulate or implement this particular use that's occurring um, should not be through that minor variance process, that it should be through consideration of all of the relevant planning policies and regulatory documents, and it should also come with consultation with a broader group and be looked at from a broader perspective. 
And so the interim control bylaw, was, as was noted, was enacted and we um, were successful in being chosen as a consultant to undertake uh, this study um, with staff's assistance and certainly with the assistance um, of a technical advisory uh, committee, which I will speak to in a moment. The intent really was to look at the particular study area and look at the use um, of motels in particular for um, accommodation which was occurring and to look at how to manage and control that as a land use in its existing context within the city of Niagara Falls. And so our process, as I mentioned, has been under, underway since uh, January of last year. Um, and I would say to you that it's been very much an iterative process. At each step we've undertaken uh, various technical reviews, we've done background research, um, we've done a lot of analysis of the existing physical conditions. We did an inventory of all of the hotels, units, locations. And we also undertook a best practice review, and that was to look at are there any other um, contexts within Ontario, within Canada, North America, where this particular issue has evolved and how have those jurisdictions, knowing that there is a legislative difference, how have they dealt with that? What types of tools have they put in place? Um, it was also very important for us to understand what the existing situation was from those who are operating um, in the facilities and on the ground, whether those are existing members within the um, business improvement area that are operating businesses adjacent to these uses, whether those are the owners and operators of these motels, and also whether those are social agencies who are providing services or actually providing for um, units within some of these uh, motel facilities. One of the things that we found is that there was a lot of consensus around trying to come up with a solution to what was seen as a very complex problem. And we certainly recognize that this is one small piece of a larger continuum related to housing issues, housing affordability, and certainly it was our attempt to try and work within this framework to come up with a solution to this particular um, issue within the city. So we undertook something quite interesting called a solutions development workshop. We found there was a lot of conflicting interests and we undertook that to get a better understanding of what the objectives were from the various stakeholders. And I think I can tell you that through that process, the consensus was people were concerned about well-being and safety of the individuals who were residing in these units. There was a lot of emphasis put on how, if any solution is put forward, it would be implemented and did the city have the appropriate resources to be able to support that implementation, not just at first, but ongoing. And certainly there was a key concern about having controls um, in place that would ensure not just that the land use was legalized, but that it would be appropriately operated to ensure that those safe conditions were continued and the city had the ability to, to uh, monitor that through um, some type of enforcement process. And so as you can see, we uh, again had uh, those various stages uh, throughout the process and at each stage where we came forward with either additional research or information or our recommendations, we were meeting with a group that was established from the very beginning. And that group included um, Councillor Wayne Campbell. It also included several members of uh, town staff, including bylaw enforcement, planning, police and fire. <laughs> Um, it also included members from regional staff, both planning and the social service agencies, and most importantly, it included members of the Lundy's Lane BIA. And so we met, as you can see, on several occasions to work through some of these issues and to work through a solution um, to those issues. And so very briefly, the research covered all areas. We looked at the existing legislation, both planning legislation and legislation around housing and accommodation, both at the provincial, regional, and local level. We looked at various strategic plans and action plans that have identified this particular issue, again, within that, uh, that spectrum of dealing with housing issues. We also, as I mentioned, did a, a best practice review, and again, that looked very broadly at other potential contexts and how they had dealt with it. And finally, we did a contextual analysis. So we understood the location, um, the physical makeup of these units, um, and also some existing conditions. <coughs> we also, as part of that contextual analysis, did a number of stakeholder interviews where we spoke to individuals about the issues in the area and some of the services that were being provided and some of the issues um, from those varying perspectives. We also know from our contextual analysis, and, and I believe, Your Worship, you had asked me this at the last 
meeting. Um, where are the individuals coming from that are residing in these units? And we, we know that it's from throughout uh, the region. It's not just within Niagara Falls. We also know that the individuals who are residing in these units are not just those in transitional housing. We know that there are students residing in these units. We also know that there are many who have been residing in these units for a number of years. This is their home. So in terms of taking all of that information, um, we knew it was important to look at the various options um, with a number of lenses from a legal land use perspective and also uh, the importance of the social lens as well as the importance of the businesses and their viability in the area and looking at land use compatibility. At that first um, options and review report, we put forward a number of options which we evaluated. One was for the ability to do a complete conversion of the motel facility, so 100% of something we referred to as a single room occupancy uh, building with single room occupancy units. And so these are units within which there are some basic necessities. Um, they would have washroom facilities, they would have some areas um, for available for preparation of food. And they would also be located within the unit that would also have a common area and some other, um, uh, the identification of some other requirements uh, to ensure that they were safe and, and healthy units within which individuals would live. And so a complete conversion was one of the options. We also looked at the idea of something we called a hybrid and that was the opportunity for um, owners or operators to take a portion of uh, the facility, might be the second floor, maybe one of the wings, maybe one or two of the units and allow this type of, of use to be in place. We also looked at the idea of actually converting it more on the uh, spectrum towards a full residential dwelling unit, which would then require compliance as a dwelling unit under the building code. We then looked at one other option, which was to provide for what we called an interim conversion or a temporary use to see how this would be implemented and what issues would come about, and then to bring forward um, uh, a, a rezoning application for those particular uses after a three-year period. Finally, we looked at the um, idea of ensuring that if um, these variations on options were brought forward, that if there was a demolition um, of the existing facility, that there would be some way to ensure that the residents or occupants were not displaced. And so we talked about the idea of having an option of some type of demolition or conversion control. We, as I mentioned, brought that um, uh, option forward to council in November um, and at that time we had recommended the full conversion option. Um, we know at that time we also um, had additional comments from the BIA who had suggested can we look further at this idea of the hybrid to allow the mix to ensure that that's perhaps the option uh, that would go forward. We were also asked to look at a number of other um, issues. We were asked to incorporate feedback and engagement with all of the BIAs across the city. And we were also um, asked to undertake a broader engagement with, with the public and hold an additional public meeting. So we took that direction from council um, and we undertook all of that with some more. Um, we actually uh, had a, what I'll call a facilitated workshop uh, with the BIAs and local agencies. And on the same day, this was back in March, I believe, of 2018, we also have a, had a public information meeting in the evening, which was very well attended. And it was at that time that we brought forward some additional information. We received further comments. Um, and at that time, we had a, a lot of interest from um, actual tenants of some of uh, the facilities as well as owners and operators, other members of the BIA, and we heard a number of concerns as well from, from enforcement, fire, and police in terms of enforcement. We took all of that information and we also, I think uh, staff had a public survey available um, online, and we received quite a number of comments through that survey that helped to inform the additional uh, considerations for the final recommendations. We also conducted a number of additional um, interviews um, with residents in the motel properties as well as with Niagara College. Um, and we also conducted a site visit and interview with tenants um, specifically at the carriage house. Um, and I can tell you, your worship and members of council, I think the most information we received on the issues that we're dealing with were from that very last site visit in talking to the individuals who were there and those who are operating these facilities to really understand what they need and what the individuals need to make this um, a viable option in terms of going forward. So based on all of that information, um, we received that feedback and we've uh, revised 
um, our recommendation through the proposed official plan and zoning bylaw amendment um, by identifying that we need to ensure that there is proper enforcement. We've provided for um, a draft um, licensing bylaw, which we've been working with staff and licensing staff over the last month to put forward to you in a draft form tonight. It still is going to need some additional work to ensure that it is um, covering all of the issues uh, that I know enforcement need to have in place. Um, we have removed the requirement for the demolition and conversion control. We still believe that this is an issue that will need to be addressed, but we think it's a broader issue than just in relation to the um, motel units for which we're recommending uh, the single room occupancy. We also sought to see that the um, bylaw in terms of the zoning bylaw as a land use would provide flexibility for the single room occupancy uh, building and or a building with single room occupancy units. So what we have put forward is the flexibility um, for an existing motel operator to have those units provided for within um, at 100% or in fact as a uh, portion of the building. One of the other changes that we looked at was ensuring that this particular use be within existing motel facilities and that it would not be something that would be built into a new building. Um, and also within those existing buildings, we're noting that it's only existing buildings within the locations for which we're introducing the use in both the official plan and the zoning bylaw. And so that would include in the official plan, I believe it's the tourist, commercial, general, commercial, and um, uh, central business areas and certainly implementing that within the zoning bylaw. And I would note in terms of that proposal that currently in the official plan, residential dwelling units are permitted in all of these areas. We're, we're suggesting this particular land use would be permitted. And within the zoning bylaw, um, the residential use would also be permitted um, if it was part of a mixed use building. But individuals would require rezoning to introduce a standalone residential use. So in terms very quickly of the proposed amendments, as I indicated, we're recommending that this new use, the single room occupancy building and the single room occupancy unit as defined is permitted in those particular designations and zones in the zoning bylaw. We're also suggesting that there are additional regulations that will be introduced through the zoning bylaw and also through the zoning, uh, sorry, the licensing bylaw and based on the existing conditions related to those three properties um, that the planning director indicated, we're suggesting that the bylaw be amended to allow for those uses as they exist to continue. Um, we should note that SROs are clearly defined in the definitions in the zoning not to be considered residential dwelling units. And so for those purposes, they wouldn't uh, be used for the, cal for the purposes of, of calculating density. And very briefly, in terms of the licensing bylaw, as I indicated, we're continuing to work on the specific wording of some of the regulations. But really, the importance here is that we've introduced the licensing bylaw and a process for which individuals would have to come forward and make an application for license. That application uh, would require compliance with um, a number of um, codes, including building code, fire code, property standards, which are outlined in the licensing bylaw. It would require an initial inspection to be um, able to be um, provided with um, the approval for the license, and that there are certain requirements set out that the individual units have to contain, and, and that speaks to safety um, and health and safety for the occupants. We've also introduced, and this is one of the things we cannot control in zoning, we can only regulate the land use building or structure. So within the licensing bylaw, we have the ability to introduce requirements for operation. So we're requiring a property manager to be on site, and that's a 24-7 requirement for any property that has 10 or more of these units. So putting in some um, controls that would be enforceable to ensure that these properties are now being properly managed um, in accordance with their licensing, uh, the license that they would obtain from the city. And so the next steps are, I believe, to continue to finalize um, any changes to the amendments, including the licensing bylaw, and to bring that back forward for Council's consideration um, in July. And with that, I'd be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dana. Um, I'll start off, I have my first question uh, in regard to the survey that was up there. 
Um, there were only, I, I think, 69 responses. So where, how was that advertised? Who did that? How was that uh, conducted? Yeah, I think um, uh, staff can answer that. It's my understanding that um, we had provided various questions from the survey, and I understand it was available on the town's website. Uh, I think it was advertised and then up for a period of about three weeks to get responses. Okay. And I know staff can add anything more to that. Yeah, Mr. Levich. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, the uh, other thing that we did do is uh, during uh, some of our consultation meetings, we had uh, iPads available with stands with that questionnaire available. So anybody who attended those meetings could answer the questionnaire right there on the spot. Uh, so again, that was kind of one-on-one -on -one contact and we assisted them through those surveys. Okay, and we did we have it on the website? Yes, yes we did. Yeah, we did, okay. And, and, uh, and that was compiled to um, CAO's office in terms of our uh, public relations officer. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Mr. Mayor, if I yes. could just add, um, I know that there was also an information report that came forward to council um, in April, and I believe it was, I'm not sure, I know it was a very, I remember recalling it was a very busy meeting, so I'm not sure if it was just an item that was received, but that set out in full detail all of the results from the survey as well. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, do we have questions of council for Dana? Nothing at this, oh yes, Councilor Kennedy. <coughs> Excuse me, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, not so much questions, I just wanted to say that uh, when Mr. Hurlovich invited me to be part of this process, I didn't realize what I was getting involved in. Um, it's been an eye opener. Um, this new bylaw, it, it's just a small step forward trying to deal with the bigger problems. And uh, uh, we do have that serious problem here in the city. So if there is a, is a motion required that this uh, be brought forward to council in July. Uh, I would like to make that motion. Okay, thank you. We're, we're not at that point yet. We're uh, still working our way through the public meeting. Yes, Councilor Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have some comments and questions, but I'll wait till after the residents have their opportunity to ask. Okay, okay. that's great. <clears throat> so members of the public, you're advised that failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting will result in the local planning appeal tribunal dismissing any referral it receives if the party has not made an oral or written submission at this public meeting. Council will now hear from anyone who wishes to speak to the proposed amendments. So if there's anyone that would like to speak here, and I'd like to also acknowledge, I know we have our district inspector, Mr. McCaffrey, uh, in the gallery as well. Thank you for being here today. So if there's anybody here, yeah, you can just come forward. Uh, whoever would like to speak, just come up to the microphone. You just introduce your, yourself with your name and your address. And we ask you to keep your comments under five minutes and try not to repeat what the last speaker has said. Hi, everybody. <laughs> My name is Linda Vessel, and I reside at 6540 Taylor Street in Niagara Falls. Um, I manage the Continental Inn on Ferry Street, 5756 Ferry Street and I've done it for almost six years, and we do run it as monthly. And um, <laughs> the one amendment that you have about having a manager living on site, if you knew what I went through, um, <laughs> you know that you need more than one manager. Um, if you guys ever wanna know what it's like, just come over and hang out with us for a day. It's a little bit chaotic, so there definitely needs to be a lot of things considered um, when using this as a, a residential or temporary residential. Um, anyway, <laughs> I just uh, I just feel like I should have talked to you guys or been approached because I've been doing it for so long. And um, we have issues, like I would love for it to be temporary and have it as a transition to like temporary or permanent housing. I think that would be the best situation because that little tiny hotel room is not good for ten pet or five pets. I have one room right now where there's um, five cats and a dog, and it's the size of the room is about 370 square feet or maybe a little bit more than that. Um, <laughs> I have problems with that. I've called the Humane Society. There's a bylaw about pets. You're only supposed to have three cats, right? Um, it, 
nothing has been done. And <coughs> so as a property manager and my boss, that's the owner, all the, the things that happen with certain people that stay at the motel, um, we get the bill. Um, they leave it disastrous um, and it's out of our control. We go through the landlord tenant board to actually um, petition them to get rid of somebody. It takes three months and by that time the, the apartment is completely destroyed and we have to re like do everything. But 90% of the people that live there are peaceful. They're, they're great people. And if you <laughs> make it harder for me to do my job, I'm going to have to quit and the place is going to get shut down and people are going to be on the street. So please, please stop. Thank you, Linda. Thank you very much. Do we have um, anyone else? Yes, sir. If you can come forward. If you can state your name and your address, please. Hi, uh, my name's Ravinder Singh and I'm actually the owner of 8675 Montrose Road. Okay. And uh, we also run monthly. I'll be honest, our experience is completely different than hers. Uh, we, we completely renovated our building. We have very respectful people that live there who are very happy that they have somewhere to stay. And uh, I feel that we provide a great service for the community. Because if these people weren't there, they'd be on the streets. And it does act as a transition. We had one tenant who's there for, our guest, who's there for nine months. She was a new teacher. Uh, her name was uh, Shelly Sherburn. She got a full-time job in Grimsby. She's a French immersion teacher. She was grateful that she had somewhere to stay right out of school. And she ended up putting a deposit on a house. So I think that what we do is really important. And uh, I mean, we work with the fire prevention officers. We work with the police. Like we don't have, you have problems everywhere, but not to that extent. So I just thought I'd come forward and say that I think this is a great idea. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have anyone else that would like to come forward? Yep, come on forward, please. You can state your name and your address, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of council for allowing me to speak. My name is Art Federal. I said to my wife tonight, I said, I'm going to wear yellow because I hope that they signify, it signifies caution in passing this bylaw. Because it could be something that goes through the stoplight and there's no repair of the vehicle or the people. Having said that, I wrote a report of my own comments and I hope that you all had it included in your package. I feel that there's significant data that was absent that allows you to make a decision properly on what's transforming here on the long term. And if we look down the road, we might be solving a problem now, and I, and I, I use an analogy of the, the people out in the country when they have a lot of water. Contractor comes in, a contractor says dig a pond. You dig a pond, it rectifies the water. The next rainfall, you got the same water problem. So you can fill all these motels. The word's going to get out that there's a lot of motels, and there's going to be a bigger problem. Now, I hope that you read my comments. I was first upset that the budding property owners didn't receive uh, notice because that affects our value greatly. If the accident turns out to be a bad accident. 20 years ago when I was on council and I attended AMO, Councillor Campbell and his wife gave me a ride home. They asked me what sessions I attended and which one I liked best. I said I attended a little red wagon. That was about the effects of welfare, how long it takes to break welfare, how many generations are on welfare, how welfare expects the, uh, affects the children's education, their living conditions. And so that's part and parcel of what we have as part of this problem today. It's a greater social issue. And I would hope that when you go to the next AMO conference, if you're thinking about voting for this, 
you start attending some of those sessions because it opened my eyes. Now, having said that, we can look at all the charts and we can have all the politicians say whatever you want, how we affected it and how we didn't affect it, but the one chart, it just keeps going up. So that affects us all, it affects us. And here's part of the data that I believe was missing. How does something like this, the illegal activity that's going on presently, how does it affect our police budget? How often do they show up there? How does it affect our emergency services and hospital budget? Because they have to go there. And this is all, this is all data that's readily available, but it's absent from the report. What about child and family services? How many are actually living in there? None of us want that to happen. But this, I don't believe, is the answer to solving these problems. I think if we really want to solve the problems, we need to take a step back and then as a whole, all the communities in the region, put forward a motion that you all get on board and you do the data, you find out the data, and you submit it to the province and you say, here's what we found out in our area. Here's what's spilling out of Toronto. Or here are the mental health issues, the alcohol, the drug addiction issues. Because when you look at, and I did, and I read the report, it took me three days. Maybe I'm a slow reader, it's a big report. But when we look at that data, and the data that's missing, it helps us formulate a better path to come up with a solution for the problem at hand. Now, what is the real problem at hand? Is it Homelessness, is that, is that what we're trying to do? Is it the marketplace for the motel owners that can't rent a room out? Are we into the housing now? What, what, it, what, is, what are we trying to solve? If we really understand what we're trying to solve, then maybe we can formulate solutions that include all the data that we should have. Police, medical, family and child services, addictions, drug and alcohol. And who in their right mind would say put all these people or allow a segment of each of those to go under one roof? Those people will have no chance of rehabilitation. And it's happening now. So if we want to help, let's figure out how we help. Let's figure out why are they tearing down schools in town? Why are they tearing down old hospitals? The old hospitals all have bathrooms and rooms and kitchens and loading docks, and parking lots, but we sell them. Why? That's a perfect spot to put this. So why don't we have a motion that says no more hospitals, no more schools, no more police stations. That needs to go to social service. Taxpayer pays three times. Renovate them, buy them, sell them, buy them again. It, it doesn't make any sense. So if we're gonna attack the issue, let's, let's really have the, the data on the issue. Having said that, I have experiences with the properties that I own. There's garbage on there. It continually comes from one of these motels because the tenants, and I can't blame them totally, they don't have proper garbage disposal. Nobody's enforcing that. It's on my property, I phone the bylaw department, the bylaw says, well, once it's on your property, it's, it's your problem. I address, the, I address the person who's throwing it. I, I, I'm there all the time. I get into a verbal confrontation, very aggressive. I approach the owner, not my problem. No, no, not my problem. Not my garbage. No, it's your tenant's garbage. Reverts back to me, I have to clean it up. I invited a counselor over this week. I said, come have a visual. That counselor visually seen rodents, numerous species, eight or nine of them running around. Visually seen garbage on my property, old TVs this big, like if I was gonna carry a TV and throw it out on the property, it'd be a flat screen. It wouldn't be an old this and an old vacuum cleaner and beer cans and, and feminine hygiene and leftover food. And it just doesn't make sense that I would pollute my own property. Physically, 
visually seen property in disrepair. So I look at that. He verbally heard one of the tenants say, we're fighting because we don't have hot water. And the lady over here, she doesn't have any heat. And I know that for certain because I talked to him because I'm there. No heat in the winter time. Heaters are plugged in. Hot plates, cooking on hot plates. Nobody wants that. But where are we when, as a society, and as a, a, a municipal a governing body, we're not regulating that. And we can hide behind by law, we can do whatever we want to do or say. The health department will run into every restaurant every week and make sure that it's clean and sanitized for the traveling tourists, but we won't take care of the people right here in our own community. The building is full of rodents. Why isn't the health department doing something about it? Let's make a motion, hey, region, when was the last time you went and checked out what well, you're supposed to check out on the health side, social, the social justice side? There's, there's many solutions here. Um, I, I think that the report, with all due respect, falls far short of what are, what's a goal. You know, I, I think about Seventy-five percent, what I find, are people suffering from mental illness of some sort, drug addiction, alcohol. You know, some are down or out in their luck. We need to we need to actually understand this. Uh, we have garbage issues. We have uh, property standards issues. We, you know, uh, the report says over and over again, illegal, illegal, illegal. There's no data in the report that says. Here is what Niagara Falls picture is. You know, you talk about people coming from different municipalities. I, I just read the paper and, and I feel s sorry for the Lundy's Lane BIA because my wife and myself, when we go away with our four kids, I punch up where's a good place to stay. I see what pops up in articles because of the worldwide technology. If I was a tourist coming to Niagara Falls, and I punched in Lundy's Lane, and the article that come up like on June 15th, woman to, be, woman to be sentenced after man stabbed in head when rendezvous flops. And it says right in there Lundy's Lane. So if I punched in Lundy's Lane, this pops up. Why should the hardworking people of Lundy's Lane have to, de have to suffer the consequences of losing business? because a prostitute didn't get paid and she felt it right to stab the guy in the head. That's not right, but worldwide technology is gonna throw it right up there. So, to go further, where are they coming from? And are they gonna keep coming? Uh, this particular woman was from Ottawa and the man was from Montreal. So we can see that they're going to start pouring out of wherever when they hear there's rooms. We talk about Brookfield Street. The property has been subject to complaints including drug deals, prostitution, piles of garbage being allowed to accumulate in the area. I'm saying that about my area. No data in the report. I think that we're gonna create pockets of crime. That's my belief. I might be totally wrong. I wanna help as much as anybody wants to help. I've been trying to clean up the area. I've been doing my best. Um, but when you keep banging your head against the wall, it makes me wonder, why would you support this without the data to really say, we need to approach it from a different perspective. We need to understand the people that need it why do they need it? What are the problems? How can we help them? If it comes down to we're going to get involved in the market, the housing market, I have a solution. Let's pass a motion that every single residential home in Niagara Falls is allowed one SRO. Watch the people get angry that not in my backyard. But if it's the housing we're talking about, then you know what? 
that solution might keep seniors in their house longer. That solution might allow millennials to buy a house because now they can go to the bank because it's legal and say, I got extra income. And it might help the people that need the help not to be put into a situation where they're beside a drug addict, an alcoholic, or somebody who's a little bit unstable that isn't getting the help from the region or somewhere. It might integrate them into the population in a subdivision. I don't know. But for me to stand up here and complain without offering a solution, there's a solution. I don't know if it's a good one or a bad one. But I do know that there's garbage, there's people without hot water, there's people, and you know what, the, the bylaw department, the fire department, I am sure that if there's no hot water and there's no heat, there's no fire alarm, there's no CO2 detector. So, do we want to help these people? Let's start with cleaning up the places. Let's not, let's not create pockets of crime because there's a community behind that little motel. And if the kids and the problems are gonna continue there, and the kids are gonna come around, they're gonna see it, they're gonna be exposed to it, it's not gonna help anything. And I believe the people come to spilling out are gonna spill out more. So it's a very difficult situation. I don't know if this is the proper solution, but I would hope that whatever the solution is, and I hope it's yellow. I hope that it starts at the top, Mr. Mayor and Mr. Todd, and the bylaw department and the fire department and the regional health department. They all take it upon themselves to say, this is where it starts. This is where it starts. People can't have rats running upstairs. You know, I want to I want to have a health official go up in that attic with no mask on and walk through all the urine and feces from all the animals that's been years that the people are living in them rooms and say, oh, no, it's okay. okay. So you can ask a question about how many people, I read in the report, how many people are, uh, are in this situation and they couldn't qualify the, 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 the amount. I think the first question should have been, what are the standards that we're letting these people live in? So we got the, we got the, the cart out in front of the horse here. Let's take care of the standards. Um, let's find out the root cause and nip it in the bud. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Federal. Any questions? We've got Councillor Thompson as a question. Yes. Uh First of all, uh, I agree with what you're talking about, and I think you're going to hear a lot more uh, this evening with respect to uh, uh, the BIAs. Uh, the speaker said all the BIAs were informed, and uh, the Lundy's Lane uh, people are here today. I had phone calls from them. They never heard anything about it, had any input into it. I'm the chairman of the Falls View BIA. I never heard anything uh, about it. And uh, I think some of your comments are very accurate, but you're probably the luckiest guy here in the room tonight because the property that you're talking about uh, is already going through a rezoning for a 35 uh, room condominium, the Surfside, and uh, Mr. Mason is at the back of the room, and I talked with him today about it because I knew he was involved, and uh, is that an accurate uh, statement, Mr. Herlovich, that there's uh, application moving through the process? Uh, in Chippewa for the surf side and the property adjacent. Mr. Lee? The property adjacent that Mr. Federal owns? He uh, certainly no. has been in our office to talk to Mr. Mason and the surf side. He's been in our office. I don't know if he has a current application. Um, well, Mr. Mason. Well, let me can just Mason speak for himself. Huh? Uh, yes, I have to be for the 35 unit. 
I welcome. I welcome any cleanup and improvement in Chippewa. I grew up in Chippewa. It's a lovely community. Try to buy a house in Chippewa. You can't. People want to be there. I welcome that. Anyway, your problem is probably going to be solved for the other ones. And uh, I'll uh, sit down now, but I, I have a lot more to say. Uh, just what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, I have talked to so many people out on Lundy's Lane, and we're talking about a housing problem here for the homeless. And uh, I, uh, uh, we're not uh, looking after people in Niagara Falls. And she said the Niagara region, I talked to a fellow, I said, how did you get here? Yeah, where are you from? I'm from Toronto. And I said, how did you get here? I went to the social services in Toronto and they gave me cab fare to come to Niagara Falls to Lundy's Lane to get a room. We're looking after everybody here. But uh, the positive thing, and I just sent this out to everybody, that uh, the uh, Renew Canada, they uh, just sent me an email that there's 55 billion in funding for financing <coughs> to build Canada's next generation of housing. And I stood here uh, four or five months ago and I said, this is not a problem that Niagara Falls can solve. And it's not <coughs> one that the region can solve. This has to be Niagara Falls, the region, the provincial government, mm -hmm. the federal government coming together and doing something for housing uh, in not only this community, across Canada. That's what has to be done. And to see this 55 billion uh, um, text uh, that that's gonna be for housing is probably the best move I've seen to solve this problem. So anyway, I'll have more to say later, but uh, I'm interested in hearing the BIAs uh, express their concern with respect to uh, the legitimate businesses that are operating out on Lundy's Lane and the other problems that are coming as a result. So what is the solution to this problem? Kick everybody out? You can't do that. Mm -hmm. How are you gonna do that? These people uh, cannot afford and they are taking the best solution that they can find to, to keep living. So this is a serious, serious problem. And uh, I'm really interested to see what some of the other people have to say. But I think your problem is going to be solved because having a 35 unit condominium, uh, I would support that in a heartbeat. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Any other questions of council for Mr. Federal? Okay, thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Do we have anyone else here that would like to present? Yep, come forward if you would. If you just state your name and your address, please. Yes, I'm uh, the, uh, the owner of 8004 Lundy's Lane. Also was the owner of the Continental Inn that I changed into uh, boarding house. Also was the owner, or still am the owner of uh, 2560 Mewburn Road, which is being demolished for a 60 unit condominium building. And also have several other properties outside the city. Uh, been in the homeless rental business for probably close to 15 years now. I've seen it all, seen it, seen from the beginning to the end, and uh, policies have made it worse. Uh, when your I name? started, sorry, your name? Uh, Bernard Peters. Okay, thank you. Policies have made it worse. Uh, bureaucrats have unfortunately made it even worser, uh, if that's even a word. <laughs> uh, uh, when I started out at the Continental many years ago and at the Northway, if I had a problem with a tenant, I'd call the police. The police removed my problem. That pro that no longer is the issue. I call the police. The police don't do anything. Uh, I could show you a video, if you wanted to plug it in, of a tenant assaulting a 14-year-old 
the mother said it was okay because the kid was mouthing off and didn't want to go to school and so the other tenant body checked him into a garbage bin and then took a swipe hit him and the police say there's nothing we can do mother said it was okay well I call that crap excuse my language but where is my help uh, you know what, if I have tenants that are really selling drugs, no help. Where's my help? You know, out of, out of the, I used to have over 200 people under my roof. I'm down to about 70, 90, right? And I'm almost up to here, right? Because I used to be able to call the police and say, get rid of that person. They would get rid of them. My problem would be gone. I have about... 90% of my tenants are great people, great honest people that just want an affordable roof over their heads. And the other 10% destroy it. There, you hear of all these complaints, yes, they're the ones that destroy it and I just have to sit there and watch. I have zero help. I don't have help from the bylaw, I'm responsible for everything. I don't have help, help from the Landlord Tenant Act, the tenant has all the rights. I don't help help from the police. There's nothing we can do. They charge somebody, arrest them, bring them to the police station. He's back in the afternoon causing the same havoc. Where's my help? Affordable housing is desperately needed in this city. I have a property. If you go by my property, it's clean. I keep it up. But when I have no authority over my tenants to clean up, all hell which breaks loose. If, if you guys are going to make some kind of license agreement, there should be responsibilities for the tenants. Never mind the landlord. The landlord has enough responsibilities to keep the property standards up. But where are the responsibilities for the tenants? They are just as much as responsible. It's their home. They need to have respect for their property. And if you don't put any teeth behind that, where you hold the tenant responsible, then it won't work. I put up a fire to smoke detector, they take it down, I get the fine. Where's my help? Right, I'm the one that gets charged, I'm the one that goes out of business, not them, they laugh. Where's the responsibility of putting the onus on them to have a smoke detector? What gives them the right to take it down and I get the fine? I have quarterly checks going through my apartment buildings or my units. A lot of the smoke detectors aren't there no more. I have to pay to replace them. If a fire department comes and checks, well, I'm ha between my quarterly, I'm the one responsible, not them. That needs to change. You know, we're talking about really people throwing garbage out. I can stand and watch. Who's gonna help me? Nobody. And if this licensing goes through, there has to be teeth for the landlord to go against the tenant. The landlord board is so broken, it's so lopsided to one side where the tenant has all the rights and I don't have no rights. Losing $60,000 in back rent in one year is no joking matter. And this year is not getting any better. I have a tenant that hasn't paid. He gets to stay in April to April 15th because I made the deal to get him out, but I'm losing $5,000 on that fellow. I have people have no respect to pay the rent. They don't care because they know they have three to four to five months. The damage they cause, I have no recourse. Try to get water out of a stone, good luck. So the biggest issue is the landlord tenant board is the biggest headache on my list. I'm, I'm working with Start Me Up to program. They're saying about mental health. Yes, mental health is a big issue and programs need to be there to come beside these uh, people to help them out. Yes, there are a lot of problems and I'm trying to get organizations, I do have organizations that work within my property to re relieve some of this pressure. I actually have a lady volunteering her time for social, for social work to talk to people about mental health issues and stuff like that. There are good people out there that are trying to make a difference, <clears throat> but if you don't support them, they're gonna go away. My Mountain Road property, it was 20 homes, no more 20 homes. Those people cried when I told them they had to leave. The Continental, the owner's gonna get fed up too. 
like my property in St. Catharines, it's going to get demolished. There's another 10 people out on the street. And it, it's, if you don't do something about this, they will be on the street. The problem's not going to go away. The problem's going to become your problem. But what are you going to do with these people? Because it's not going away, it's getting bigger. And there needs to be a social net to help people that want to help. You need to come behind them and support them, not beat them to the ground. And that's all I have to say. Thanks thank very you. much, Mr. Peters. Any questions of counsel, for Mr. Peters? Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Do we have anyone else that would like? Yep, just come forward, sir, to the microphone. If you would please state your name and your address. Good evening. My name is Brian Cleeton. It's 5756 Ferry Street, the Continental Inn. I'm one of the managers there. I came to this uh, this particular building about nine years ago, broken and shattered for reasons I won't go into. Health was gone. I had 76 cents in my pocket. And I was walking up Ferry Street to Pierce Street to get a, a relief until my federal pensions came in. And I walked into this gentleman's uh, motel and he, uh, he granted me a room. And uh, it changed my life in ways I, I'm not gonna bore you with. I think the issue here is, as I understand it, affordable housing. Well, one of my problems is I have a tendency to simplify things. At the Continental Inn, of which I'm one of the managers, we are providing affordable housing without a penny of public money involved. So I, I have a little difficulty understanding the, the, the implementation of some of the, uh, the, the problems they're going through. This uh, eloquent gentleman in the yellow back here who was so concerned about garbage, I understand that. This is a, a practical issue that we're facing that nobody is actually addressing. What do we do when someone piles garbage outside their room? The truth is, we do not, absolutely nothing. I can tell him to move it, and he says no. What are my options? I can't call the police to remove garbage, so we have to remove it ourselves, which adds to the cost of, uh, of uh, maintaining the property, obviously, or we just let it rot. I can't evict them because it takes three to four to six months to evict anybody in this province, and that's outside of the jurisdiction of this council. I know that's the Landlord Tenant Review Act. I'm sometimes very, very sarcastic, something, everything we talk about here today should be set aside until that, that, until that act is revised. I'll give you one piece, one sim simple example. I cannot discriminate, I can discriminate to rent to somebody who has an animal. The Law and Law Tenant Re Act of 2006, I think it is, gives me that right. But once the tenant is, is, uh, is in place, they can bring in an animal. I'm sorry, but as I say, I simplify things that could only be written by madmen. I, I repeat, they could only be written by mad men. Because the, what happens is obvious. Nothing happens. No one does anything to, to, to help the, the landlord. We are providing affordable housing right now, but this study, I, I don't know where we, we missed this study, but no one came to us and asked us what we were doing, yet we were a success, successful operation. <clears throat> and we're being handicapped. Paul Linda over here, who manages, I used to manage it, but I turned it over, creeping old age made me turn it over to Linda. She has a life threatened. Call the police, nothing happens. We need enforceable laws. We need laws, clearly delineated laws, laws with parameters as to responsibility and what happens when people don't make those responsibilities. And nobody seems to be addressing that issue. What happens when the tenants do not meet their obligations to pay rent? We can't, we can't provide maintenance if, if people are not pay, paying rent. It's a, sim it's a, simple, uh, a simple equation. What we need is yeah, I get so upset because the problem seems to me so simple that we have to be able to evict people who are causing damage to the property and or their neighbors. And nobody is addressing this issue and it's critical. We have, we're, we're close to closing our doors because of this issue. It's profitability has gone out of the window. We, we, in compliance with all known city bylaws, if we're in violation of bylaw and somebody points it out to us, we act immediately. We have a pretty good record at the Continental. And I know Mr. Peters is doing it at the, at the carriage house too. If, we, if, if we're negligent in some fashion, we'll correct it, and we do. But as I say, it takes three to four, to, sometimes as long as six months to, to, to solve a problem. And that, that seems to be society's uh, uh, problem today, is that we're overly officiated. 
So please, when you're deliberating this in the future, please take into consideration the practical implementation of what you do. As we say, we, we call the police and they get put up with us and we need response time because if we call the police, it's going to be serious. How serious it can be when we've been assaulted. This gentleman was complaining because somebody was throwing garbage over into his lawn. Well, we I have exactly the same situation in the Continental. There's nothing I can do about it. We built a retaining uh, fence, which I don't even know if that's in compliance with any bylaw. Nobody's said anything to do it. And people just throw their garbage over it. And there's nothing we can do to stop it because they know that we can do nothing. No one will enforce these laws. So when you're drafting laws, please understand the, the, the actual practical implementation of enforcing these laws. Now, as I say, we're providing affordable housing, and it seems to me that the government is not going to forgive us for that. We're doing it without a penny of public money. We, through an outreach program, we have working out of the building, which is a, a generous donation by the owner. We serve five free hot meals a week to people. Five free hot meals a week. We provide clothing for them. We provide them, uh, we provide them with uh, uh, amenities. Uh, Linda takes people around and, and, and drives them to uh, hospital appointments and doctors and banking appointments and grocery shopping. We, go, we take our tenants down to Project Share every Thursday. And we, we, we make, we, it is a profitable, economically viable operation. But nobody, nobody has come to us and asked us how we're doing it. And I find that a little bit mystifying, that we're a successful operation and nobody, come, nobody has just come to ask us what we're doing and how we're doing it. I could go on for the rest, of the, night, the rest of the night, but please, as you're deliberating, please understand the practical implementation of what, you do, of what we're doing. Another issue is like the health board, which I know is not jurisdiction. We provide five free hot meals, and we're coming under the jurisdiction of the Ontario Health Board to ensure that our food is adequately prepared, which is understandable. But I'm, I argue that the infinitesimal chance of us providing some food to someone and they get ill from it versus the absolute certainty that they're going to go hungry if we don't do that, to me, is, is the de definition of a no-brainer. End of tirade. Thank, Thank you. Listen. Thank you very much. Do we have anyone else, <clears throat> excuse me here, other than the applicant who wishes, yep, yeah, if you can come forward, sure. Hi, I apologize, uh, Mayor, Council, and staff and residents. I wasn't prepared to speak tonight, but um, sitting there listening to the residents, I think we have to remember that cities are for the residents, and unfortunately not all residents are um, rich and uh, have um, good mental health and uh, have adequate housing. So unfortunately we're in a crisis situation in the Niagara region right now. We're 23,000 um, units short of affordable housing. And I think that because we've reached a crisis that we have to um, adopt measures that we may not consider um, in other times. There are supports available. Um, I work at Project Share. Uh, we are part of a consortium. Uh, we've bought the franchise for the province for Rent Smart Ontario. It's a really successful support um, for tenants uh, in BC. And we teach people how to be better tenants except that there are no affordable units to place the tenants in. Uh, in BC, landlords, um, they have to go through, I think it's a three-day program, and they learn you have to pay your rent. It sounds so simple. Uh, you have to um, observe quiet after a certain uh, time in the evening. But some people don't know this. So um, there are also supports available through the region, uh, housing first, rent supports. We have uh, somebody who's qualified for the Housing First program, which offers a social worker um, that works with the person to deal with their mental health, to get them supports for their addictions. However, the main thing about Housing First is Housing First. So um, I just wanted to raise the issue that we don't have um, affordable housing for these supports, because this gentleman's been waiting, I think, about five months now to be housed. So um, also, um, we're seeing homeless families every week at Project Share. I just um, just uh, brought a food voucher up on Friday to a single dad with, uh, it was just heartbreaking, 11-year-old and two little kids. And uh, there's no place to put them. Um, nice gentleman. Just, but, but right now at Project Share, we're getting people from Toronto who've secured work in the Niagara region. Um, hey, you know, you, you uh, 
hook people up with housing. Can you help us? You know, I have a good job. I just got a job in, in Niagara Falls and want to move my wife and, and two kids down. And it's like, no, I'm sorry, we can't help you. So, so we also have to consider the economic uh, consequences of not having affordable housing because not everybody who works can afford um, 1200 a month, which is the going rate for single apartment. And that's thank it. You. Just wanted any questions? No? Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Is there anybody else who wishes to address council? Okay. That's your last chance. Because you can't speak later, just so you know. If you don't speak now, you cannot, there is no other opportunity. Okay. Yes. I'm sorry. Yep. Sorry, yes. I apologize, yep. Your Worship. I don't know if it's appropriate or not, yep, but I, I know there are a number of issues, issues that were raised from the speakers, and I wanted an opportunity, with all due respect, to clarify yes, a few things that were, that were said. Um, first of all, I know there was an issue related to the missing um, data, and mm -hmm. I can tell you that we did have substantial data, actually, in relation to uh, what I'll call incidents reports um, that were associated with various facilities in the study area. That included fire um, and police reporting. Um, we felt it was in the best interest for privacy reasons, and we discussed this with staff and legal, not to publish that information in association. But we did have that information, and that was used to inform the types of issues that we were dealing with outside of the land use issue, remembering that this is a land use study, and it's looked at through the social lens. So we did have that data available, and it is part of the study. It is just not public. I also wanted to note that in terms of some of the standards and concerns um, about garbage disposal and disrepair and property standards and conditions, many of those issues um, have been identified and it's through the licensing bylaw in relation to operations that we would be able, the city would be able to address um, those concerns. We also did have discussions with a number of owners and operators of the facilities um, including um, the Space Motel, and as I mentioned, we did have an opportunity to interview and discuss um, issues with the tenants um, at the Carriage House and with the operator there, and there were other interviews as part of the stakeholder interviews that were conducted with a number of service providers in the area, and we recognize that in the zoning bylaw that many of these facilities also have support services either coming on site or located on site to support, um, uh, to provide support for some of the tenants. Um, I do understand the concerns about um, providing some enforcement in relation to uh, tenancies. I would just note that whether this is a motel, an SRO unit, or a residential unit, those issues in relation to tenancies and issues and eviction would apply to all three. And it certainly, it is an issue, it's a challenge, but it does go beyond the scope of what we can address through um, some of the um, amendments that we're bringing forward. And finally, I would say with all due respect, um, the BIAs were very engaged in this process. The Lundy's Lane BIA had two members that attended, if not all of the TAC meetings we have, which I believe were a cumulative of six. Um, all of the BIAs were provided and circulated with an email identifying uh, the additional consultation for the study. They were invited to the March 18th meeting, both the workshop in the morning and the uh, public meeting in the afternoon, and some of them did attend. So to say that we have not informed and they are not aware, I don't think from my opinion, um, is not the case in, for this study. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. For that. Any other, any questions uh, of council for Dana? Okay, seeing none. Yeah, is there anyone else here then that would wish to address council? You could state your name and address, please. Uh, Tim Parker, Victoria Center and BIA. I just, my comments are added um, in your packets that we sent the information to you forward earlier. I just want to add the fact that we did receive and go to the open house in March here and at the um, museum, but that was the only, the only information that we got from this whole study that's been going on for two years. So we haven't been involved at all with this except for the March 18th meeting. So we, we haven't seen any meetings before that or any studies after that. We only informed once. Thank you. Oh, hold on one second, your, uh, your Mr. Parker. <laughs> <laughs> my opinion's in my notes. I, I, I haven't seen your notes. <laughs> well, then that's your clerk's your fault then, because he didn't give them to you then. I don't know. 
the, I, we sent the, we sent the, the letter sent this, this afternoon. afternoon. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I, they, they, I don't want to delay Excuse this. me just one second. Our clerk, uh, we're just going to get clarification. The notes came. When did they come in? Uh, we received from the uh, Victoria Center BAA this afternoon and they were distributed to council via email and added to the agenda this afternoon when we received them. So if you can, I don't know if you're, you're able to uh, give us a quick synopsis because we started this afternoon at 3.30, so probably most of us never had a chance to read them, okay. right. myself just, included. Sure, okay. So this is uh, to uh, Mayor Diodati and members of City Council. In January 2018, the Technical Advisory Committee, which included the London's Lane BIA, was created to address the very complex issue of the Borden House and Term Control Bylaw Study. So the process it became very clear that this is more than a citywide problem, that there is no single straightforward solution to tackle the issue of, of regulating extended stay operations in the lodging sector. What we may feel best is predominantly non-tourism areas is not what is realistic in predominant tourist commercial areas. The Victoria Center BIA has reviewed the final MHBC Borden House study and cannot support a citywide adoption of the as of right proposed SR units, SRO building model. Commercial, tourism commercial, zone needs to focus on economic development. The Victoria Center BIA is mandated to develop and create and maintain a healthy environment for a business to prosper and ultimately benefit the community as a whole. The Victoria Center BIA is very proud of our strong working relationship with the council uh, and staff and the development of the strategic plans like the Victoria Center Streetscape Project and the master plan that, that we uh, are currently in. These initiatives are to develop and enhance the public realm as well as incentivize for new investment in facades and landscape improvement grants to help the private sector grow. The Victoria Center BIA promotes residential infrastructure along the Victoria and, and Ferry Street Corridor in accordance with the urban design guidelines that have been laid out to ensure a healthy and vibrant community to live in and do business and, and do business in the area. So basically what it says is we enjoy the businesses that we have, we enjoy the businesses that have put millions of dollars into their businesses and to convert older businesses to SRO dwellings is not something that we've ever planned in our long-term uh, planning stages. It just, it's not fit, it's not correct, it doesn't, it just doesn't fit in our area. So we, we, we're not really happy with the study because we had not a chance to really look at the study and, um, and comment on it through the two years that it's been going on. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Parker? Okay, thank you. We're good. Three o'clock, we were in a meeting here. That's why we didn't. Do we have any other speakers that'd like to address council? Yep, come forward and state your name and address, please. Good evening, worship, council members of the public and staff. My name is David Yovanovich. I'm the project administrator of the Lundy's Lane BIA. Tim has stolen some of my thunder here with the relevance here. In January 2018, the Technical Advisory Committee was established and included the Lundy's Lane BIA. And the Lundy's Lane BIA was part of the entire process up until <coughs> the last public sessions which were held in March. The findings from the, uh, the process were then never brought back to the Technical Advisory Committee for discussion. It was decided amongst city staff and the consultants as to what the final report would look like. The Lundy's Lane BIA did not see the final report until it was released to council and we got a copy of it on Friday morning. We attended the CIP open house two weeks ago. And at that time, I asked Francesca, who was uh, taking the place of John Barnsley, as to what is happening with the, uh, the boarding house study. She said, well, you should have received notice. I said, the Lundy's Lane BIA has not received notice. So at that time, she indicated to me, she sent to me, uh, the notice that it would be held this evening. On Monday morning, we had a meeting at Niagara Falls Tourism, of which the other BIAs were present, and I presented each one of the BIAs with a copy of this notice for the meeting. I said, are you aware that this meeting is even happening? You participated in the open house process back in, in March, April, and everyone's there, no. So the lateness of some of the correspondence coming back is due to the fact 
that it never came before the London, before the BIAs. And if council recollects, this was also brought up in November. And at that time, there's a motion by council made that all the BIAs need to be informed of upcoming events. We were not in that particular process. The long and the short of this is the London Zealand BIA has had the chance to review the final uh, boarding house study and cannot support a citywide adoption of the as of right proposed SRO unit, SRO building model. Commercial tourism zones need to focus on economic development. The London's Lane BIA is mandated to develop, create, and maintain a healthy environment for business to prosper and ultimately benefit the community as a whole. The BIA is very proud of our strong working relationship with staff and with council and the development of a strategic working relationship for plans like the Lundy's Lane Streetscape Master Plan and Community Improvement Plan. These initiatives are developed to enhance a public realm as well as incentivization for new investment in facade and landscape uh, grants to help spur the private sector. Lundy's Lane CIP, in the creation of that document, it really focused on residential intensification. That is one of our priorities on Lundy's Lane. And it has to be in accordance with the urban design guidelines, which were uh, created to ensure that we develop a healthy and vibrant community to live and do business in. The adoption of this as of right proposal will affect the confidence of investors and create a high level of uncertainty amongst current business operators in the city's vital commercial and tourism commercial zones. Though unintended, this proposal will have significant detrimental long-term long-term uh, effects that will seriously hinder positive growth and create a whole slew of new problems. Council must resist this easy fix approach to deal with the issues that currently exist in affordable social housing. Since day one, the Lundy's Lane BIA has been on record as to be willing to be a partner in any initiative or any task force looking at developing sustainable and livable affordable housing in Niagara. We are there, this, we're all, this is a problem that we all have to face. This is something that is currently being offloaded on some of the vital commercial quarters in Niagara. It can't happen that way. The long-term impact can be significant. You've heard issues of problems on some of the current establishments that are operating in that fashion on mitigating the problems that they face. This in itself is not the answer. There is a much bigger problem out there. It's much more complex and it needs to be dealt with. So I wish that council takes this into consideration in your deliberation. We've been part of the process. We weren't part of the final document, and that's very disturbing, because we had asked for seasonality aspects. There's a number of other things. But to just take this and adopt it as it is, is not the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions of council for Mr. Jovanovich? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, last call, folks. Uh, I know you're not all coming to speak. <laughs> you stayed around a lot longer than I expected. Thank you. Thank you. Won't do that again, will you? So last chance, if there's anyone here, before I close, I am going to close off this public meeting. I don't know, are you coming? For, no? Okay. Well, that's it. The public meeting with respect to the proposed official plan and zoning bylaw amendment is now concluded.
looking for direction of council. Councilor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is a very complex issue. It's not just about housing, it's about affordable housing, it's about mental health, it's about um, drugs, drugs, drug addictions. We're trying to solve a problem here. I'm a huge <coughs> proponent for affordable housing. We have to find the right solution and we're trying to talk to many different stakeholders, which we've done and I, I would really like to congratulate the two year study with um, Mr. Hrlovich and the, the speaker. A lot of effort has gone into this. Um, when I look at a proposal, I look at what stakeholders are part of it and I try to look for a win-win situation. And quite honestly, I've looked at this and I'm not sure this is a win-win for anybody. Right now, we're dealing with a lot of substandard living conditions in some of these motels. Not all of them, but in some of them. And we, w we wanted to fix this by putting a zoning bylaw in place. I'm afraid if this goes through, a couple of things are going to happen. One, some of the motel owners will not adhere to what they're supposed to do, and then we have to enforce it. That's going to create a lot of issues with um, time, money, uh, those types of commitments. For the hotels that do follow what they're supposed to, what is going to happen is they're going to invest a lot of money to bring it up to, sub to standards, and then they're going to raise the rents. And then the, they will probably end up evicting the people that are there and that are paying the lower rents, and they will not be able to afford it. I talked to Mr. Hurlovich and asked a couple of questions earlier today, and I asked him if this goes through, what's going to happen? So they're going to write letters to all of the motels to say um, it would have to come back in July for us to approve it, but then eventually letters would go out for them to um, <coughs> adhere to what's going on. And if they don't, then enforcement starts. So this could be as early as August that this could happen. I don't know if we're prepared for this. Um, a couple of the issues in the proposal, I read about that people would have to give their next of kin. And I thought, well, why would that be part of this proposal? If you rent an apartment, do you have to give your next of kin? I think we're treating this a little bit differently than apartment rentals. I know it's a different land use. I do believe that the BIA should be part of it. They were part of it earlier, and then they got dropped off. And when I read Mr. Federo's report, it talked about a 100-page report that you could go down to City Hall. So I've been trying to co contact building to get that and finally I was able to get it today. Uh, it was a very large report. It could not be sent by email. I had to get a link and I did send it out to the council members. If I'm given a report, I will read it. I could not read 200 pages today. <laughs> so my, my recommendation would be to defer this to another time that we have the opportunity to read this report. I would like to include some of the stakeholders that feel that they're not. Uh, included, I would like to include them as well. So that would be my recommendation. Okay, so we have a motion for deferral, which is not debatable. Um, so, and you're deferring it until when? Just the only thing we can talk about is a timeline. I'm deferring July. it until, I, I guess July, until we have the ability to read that 200 page report. And I would like to include the stakeholders that did not feel that they were part of this and maybe get some more information. If we can't have it all for July, it would have to be at another time. Okay. Okay. So you heard the motion. Uh, we're going to have to call the vote. It's been moved by Councilor Lococo, seconded by Councilor Thompson, that we defer tonight's report until the soonest July or as soon as we can get all the information together. All those in favor? Uh, recorded vote, please. Recorded vote. Okay. Council's heard the motion. Uh, Councilor Campbell? Against. Councillor Dabrowski? Yes. Councillor Curio? Conflict. He has conflict. Sorry. Councillor Lococo? In favor? Yes. Councillor Peter Angelo? Yes. Councillor Strange? Yes. Councillor Thompson? Yes. And Mayor Diodati? Opposed. And that's defeated. Okay, so we're looking for another motion. Councillor Campbell? Well, I, I was trying to make a motion incorrectly before, but I just want to let say that we've heard a lot of different things tonight. Gentleman over here says 90% of the people that he has in his motel are good people. That 10% is going to always be out there. 
the problem is that the housing is presently going on in all these areas and there's no control over it. None whatsoever. The guy that doesn't have heat is not gonna complain because he knows he's gonna get thrown out. What we're trying to do, what this program's trying to do is get it down in, on paper. Create a bylaw that will allow for the standards to be brought up to what's a living space. That's all it's trying to do. And I, I would love to be able to solve all the other problems that happen in, in society. Mental health, most of those are mental health problems. They're, 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 they are self-medicating. But that's not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to to make something happen with respect to the two years we spent on this study. And I'm making the motion that we move forward and uh, uh, I do believe it's going to come back. The decision is not made tonight as a final decision. If it was intended to be brought back in July. Is that the case? Was that the uh, recommendation? Mr. Ilovich? That was the recommendation of staff. Uh, certainly uh, some of the uh, items that Councillor Lococo brought up, such as registering and next of kin in the light through the licensing. Uh, we've had a meeting uh, with the consultants and uh, our solicitor, a teleconference meeting, and certainly uh, it was recognized that that would be an inappropriate kind of uh, requirement. I think the intention is that there be a, a local person uh, <coughs> that would be responsible for the building, but a residency requirement, as it's outlined, would not be a requirement. So there are a number of modifications that we would be bringing forward to the licensing bylaw, but basically the zoning and official plan would move forward in July. Um, these are permissive documents. They're not required documents. So it doesn't mean that every motel has to become an SRO. Those that are motels that are operating well will continue to operate well. Um, you heard from the consultants, this is an opportunity for existing motels. So you can't build a motel and then put single room occupancy in it. It's to address, as the current council, Councilor Thompson is saying, or what uh, Campbell is saying rather, is that um, we're trying to bring the minimum standards up to a safe level for the residents. So that's the purpose of the study. So yes, we intended to bring it back in July for uh, adoption of the OP and passing of the zoning. So I would move that recommendation that staff bring it back in July. Okay, we have a motion by Councillor Campbell to move the recommendation in the report. Do we have a seconder? Do we have a seconder? Okay, so that motion doesn't fly. So, Council, that's two down. We'll go for three. Well, I'm Councilor Strange. I'm not learning a motion, but it was it was very interesting to to hear the report. I know we put a lot of work into it, and uh, the the BIAs were involved. But we actually got three letters from three of the BIAs today that say when they were against the report. Um, two of the people here that were on actually the uh, the TAC committee. You know, I think this and Art said it very well. This is just not. A city problem. This is, and and Councillor Thomas as well. This is, this is a regional problem. This is a province problem, and this is a federal problem. Something I don't think that's going to get solved tonight. You know, and you hear a lot about how you get tenants out. You know, the Residential Tenancy Act is we fight it for years. How you can't get tenants out? You know, you, they're in there, and, and Linda here, man, you're you're an angel. You know, you, you have a, a passion for helping people. And I, I feel, because you love it so much, but yet you're not feeling safe at work. I can tell that you're just, you know, you're, you're getting emotional about, you know, you've got more than one person in a room plus three dogs and cats and you phone me main side, you're just looking for help and there's no help available. So, you know, to, to add to the, to the problem and keep having these kind of, SROs in different motels is, is not going to help, I don't think. I think it needs more research and we need help 
you know, from the region and the province and the feds. This is something that's not going to go away, obviously, but I, th I think it's it's something premature to pass something like this tonight, so I, I can't uh, help support this. Okay, do we have a motion by Councillor Thompson, or P Peter Angel? I'll speak, Your Worship. Yes, please. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Um, I know it's already been said that uh, it is, that it's a complex issue, and it certainly is a complex issue. Um, I think there's two sides to this coin. One is uh, zoning, which is the black and white side, and the other side is social housing, which isn't so black and white, and that's what really uh, makes it a difficult decision, Your Worship. Uh, I know that the BIAs, uh, they wrote letters and they came up and they spoke, but they did so reluctantly because they don't want to seem insensitive. But to them, the issue is very black and white. It's all about zoning. And any time that you start to take parcels of land out of commercial zones, then you weaken the integrity of that actual commercial zone. And I think that's really what they're trying to say. And uh, if I could draw a parallel, I mean, we're looking at putting residential uses in commercial zones, the commercial operators are asking us not to do that. Recently, council dealt with Airbnbs, where we were looking at commercial uses in residential zones, and all the residential owners were asking us, please don't allow these commercial uses in the residential zones. It was the exact flip, Your Worship, but you can draw a parallel between the two. And that's the black and white side of the zoning of it. I guess the, the social housing issue would be uh, a bit more blurry. And I know uh, you can't go a week anymore without reading a story or listening to something on the radio about the need for affordable housing. And I know that Ms. Corkum uh, did a great job in, um, in, you know, I guess, telling us that the need is out there and, uh, and that it's real. Um, but, you know, you worship to that, I kind of draw another parallel. And recently we dealt with the demolition of the old town hall. And when we dealt with it, we had a presentation at council and we showed these pictures and we said, look at the disrepair that this hall is in. We have no choice but to do this. And I think that's what Ms. Corcoran was saying is, look at the state of social housing. You have no choice but to do this. And after we ended up saying that, we ended up getting emails from people saying, well, how did it get to this state? Weren't you the ones that were in charge of City Hall? Weren't you the ones that were in charge of the old town hall? And while social housing is not um, a municipal responsibility, I think that we do play a part in it. I know that the actual responsibility would be more in regional social housing and also the province of Ontario and, and the feds to some degree when you get to the infrastructure part of it. Um, but I do feel uh, that I have an onus to help as well. Part of what I struggle with, I know that uh, it was talked about, were the units that these people will end up living in. And um, I think to myself that if regional housing was to actually construct units or if they were to find someone that was going to construct units, would this be the standard? And I think I already know the answer before I ask the question. And the answer is no. And I actually have a hard time uh, thinking to myself that I'm doing something good by allowing someone to uh, live in a place that I know is never going to is never going to have a stove, <coughs> yeah. is never going to have uh, cabinets that they're going to be able to keep plates and glasses and uh, pots and pans. There's nowhere to cook. Uh, there's nowhere to uh, wash vegetables or fruit unless you go to the bathroom sink. Um, that's part of what I struggle with, Your Worship, and that's why for me it's hard to move forward and say that this is all going to be legalized now. Um, I think what we should be doing is, is going back to what Councillor Strain said and uh, looking to tackle the issue more from the standpoint of how do we actually build affordable housing. And uh, to that end, Your Worship, I mean, uh, I don't know that these SROs are the answer. Uh, I think we have to be looking at uh, how do we how do we entice developers to build social housing? You know, maybe there's a CIP that we can pass that would alleviate uh, would alleviate them of development charges. I know that we've already done that. Permit fees, but as well, I mean, um, you know, through CIPs we can offer incentives uh, such as um, uh, breaks on taxation. Um, and the other thing that I think uh, 
I would like to offer, Your Worship, is all city properties. I don't understand why we don't put it out there uh, as an offering, as a partner, to say, take any city property you want, give us a proposal. You know, as long as it meets some minimum requirements, I would like to see some form of housing built that at least would have a portion of it to be social housing. Um, so, I mean, I'm fine with not moving forward with this as of right and uh, continuing to uphold that rezonings come in for SROs because I do think that we should have that control. Um, but I also want to move forward, Your Worship, with, uh, with putting it out there that uh, we partner with anyone who is willing to build something with our own city properties. Did you want to <coughs> put that together into a motion? Um, yeah, I guess so, Your Worship. Um, I guess my motion would be that um, uh, SRO designation continue to go through or go through a rezoning application uh, and that council look at the policies um, that are derived behind those SROs. And furthermore, that the City of Niagara Falls um, advertise uh, for partnership any city-owned property that we have. So um, that just means, Your Worship, that if, the, if there's developers out there that want to uh, put together a proposal and give it to us, we'll consider it. And if it's reasonable, then let's get some housing built in our city. Um, and I guess the third part to my motion would be uh, that we investigate the, the use of a CIP around affordable housing, because I really think that there's some uh, good incentives there that we would be able to offer that right now aren't offered. So. Okay, so my motion. Seconded by Councilor Strange. Uh, speaking to the motion, Councilor LaCoco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Councillor Peter Angelo, could you please repeat the first part of it? I got the second part about um, city buildings, and I got the third part about um, CIP. I didn't understand the first part and how it has to do with it. <coughs> yeah, sure. I guess right now, Your Worship, the recommendation that is before us is to uh, allow SROs as of right across commercial zones. And um, what I think would be appropriate is that um, council continue to uh, uphold commercial zones by uh, making SRO designations um, submit a rezoning application so that they become uh, something that council ends up dealing with. It's different than the recommendation that's on the floor because the only thing that council is going to do if they pass the recommendation that's, that's in the report is they're going to craft policies and then landowners only have to go down to City Hall and meet the minimum requirements that are in our policy in order to get our SRO designation. Uh, right now, without this recommendation, landowners have to actually make an application to be uh, converted to the designation of SRO. And what I'm saying is that that should remain and that council should then again look at those policies. Does that help? Yes, Councilor? Could we divide the three motions? Uh, yes, we parts. could. If you make that request, we can divide it into yes, three. Yes, I would like to divide them, please. Okay. Uh, any other questions to the Councilor Campbell? Yes. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I'd like to have uh, Mr. Hurdlevich comment on, on the motion before Council. Okay. We can ask him to do that. Mr. Hurdlevich. <coughs> well, I, I follow what Councilor Peter Angelo said in terms of applying for an SRO site specifically and I don't know that that's a bad idea at least uh, opens the door I just don't know that the fellow on Lundy's Lane or Victoria Avenue that has a motel that he's renting out is going to rush in here and say can you please legitimize the use that I'm currently operating for which you're not actually prosecuting me I don't think they're going to break our door down for that we need to have official plan policies that would guide zoning review. So if we don't adopt the official plan amendment that's before you, then where are the policies that are going to guide that? And if you're going to require that they do a site-specific 
OPA and a zoning bylaw amendment, that's a $13,000 fee. I, again, someone who's trying to provide affordable housing is unlikely to spend $13,000. I don't know if Mr. Peters is still here, but I'm sure he would comment uh, that $13,000 is a lot of money. Uh, so I'm not quite sure. I like the concept. I don't know. Maybe staff can take that back and investigate it. We can maybe work with our consultants and report back on how that, that might work. But you know, I, I see the good aspects of it and I see some complications to it. So I, I don't have you know, a quick remark that I can answer the councillor's question. Thank you, yes, Thank Councilor you, Your Worship. Um, you know, there's a lot of discussion with respect to the region, if, if I may, through you, ask a question to the consultant. Yes. How much money is the region spending on a monthly basis paying rent <coughs> to motels that are illegally operating <coughs> these home, these rentals? on a monthly basis? Um, I'm not sure it's through you, your worship to Councillor Campbell. I'm not sure we know the amount, but we do know, and I think the issue was raised, would the region, if they were um, constructing these units, have them in the same state and condition as the ones that are being occupied? And the answer to that is yes, because they currently are. And I believe... So To that. So we currently know that they have space for 10 units in one of the facilities. And I also know there are other agencies who have the same type of arrangements with the facilities whereby they provide the transitional housing for those individuals. I, I just don't have the numbers. So, so the, my point is the region is already involved in, the, in helping people here in our community. I don't know why the hesitation is, as Mr. Hurlovich said, just, this is simply a rezoning. It's not going to be a rush of 500 motels next month to come, come down to the building department. It's a, it's a step forward. I don't want to be seen or be viewed as the city that's not willing to help the less fortunate in our community. And I don't know where all the negative is around this table. We've worked for two years on this, this study. Staff recommends it. There's something wrong. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Councillor Pierangelo. Yeah, Your Worship, and, and just to that, I, I have no negative view towards social housing, Councillor Campbell. Uh, none, none, none whatsoever. Um, what I'm saying is that I, 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 I struggle with allowing this uh, substandard, in my opinion, uh, living to be legalized. And what I would rather see is I would rather see this council be part of a solution that provided adequate housing. And I, I don't even know that I accept the answer that if the, uh, if the region was to build affordable housing, they would be uh, without a kitchen sink, without cabinets, uh, with, without stoves, without things of that nature, Your Worship. Yep, Councilor Campbell. In response, unfortunately, it is going on. I realize that. It is. I realize that. And nothing is being done about it. This was an attempt to bring it up to the next level. What you're going to say, what you're saying is, let them, just leave it the way it is. Let them live in the misery that, that some of them are living in. Yes, Councilor. Yeah, thanks, Your Councilor. Worship. And I, I'm not saying that at all. I, I don't like the fact that um, that motels have become permanent residences for people. Um, and I'm not saying that it's okay. What I'm saying is let's be part of a solution that, that builds affordable units for these people uh, so that they can transition from, in my opinion, the substandard living that they have right now into, into a place that's better. And I'd rather be part of the solution. Thank you, Councillor Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Substandard to me is rats, no heat. When it comes to substandard being that maybe we don't have 
cabinets to put dishes in. I think that's all in the eyes of who lives there. I've talked to a lot of people that said, this is all I need. I, all, that's all I need is this small room. I don't need a bigger room. I don't need um, you know, a den. I don't need that. If people are willing to live in there and they are up to standard, then that's what people can choose to live in. The difficulty I have is, yes, they're living in substandard uh, situations right now. My fear is, if we implement this, and now it's illegal, and they will be, um, there will be enforcement for the, the landlords to bring it up to a certain code, either they don't, and then we have to enforce it, which do we have manpower, or if they do, are they investing a lot of money and it's driving the prices up? We keep saying that housing is a regional issue. It is, but it's our issue. We have people living in such substandard conditions. We have people that have, are living in tents because they can't find somewhere else to live. We have to do something, and I, I agree with a lot of the comments that um, Councillor Peter Angelo said, and I agree with comments that Councillor Campbell said. We have to do something. I just don't know if this is the right solution, and that's why I asked to defer it as opposed to vote it down. Thank you. Okay. If there's no further comments, we're going to vote on the three motions. Individ yes, Councillor Kennedy? Recorded Kennedy's. vote on each one of them. Okay, recorded vote on all three of them. I'm hoping uh, our clerk has a, had a chance to make notes on those three motions as well. Okay, Councillor Peter Angelo can uh, correct me if I'm off on any of these. Uh, the first part of it being that uh, a single room occupancy designation uh, continue to go through a zoning bylaw uh, amendment uh, and that council look at uh, revising any of the policies that are in place. I, I believe that uh, uh, staff, Mr. Hurlovich had mentioned that uh, that may also include uh, going through official plan amendment as well. I, I, I know in the past they haven't had to, so I don't understand why they would have to now. Um, Can we I'll, get... I'll, yeah, I'll definitely speak to that, Your Worship. Um, I know in the past it was a simple uh, zoning amendment, and that's why they had come to Committee of Adjustments. So I don't understand now why they would have to go through a site-specific zoning, which I agree with Mr. Herlovich would be very costly. But I think a simple zoning bylaw amendment would be sufficient Mr. Hurwicz, could you comment on that? <coughs> Simple zoning bylaw amendment versus official plan? Um, so when they went to the Committee of Adjustment, the uh, tourist commercial zone allows dwelling units on the second floor of a commercial building, two-story building, and so the request was to allow residential units on the first floor of a commercial building, so we're extending a land use that was already permitted. So we're now introducing a brand new land use type. I suppose if we say that this is a residential unit, although we were avoiding, as it says on the screen, calling them residential dwelling units because we didn't want to address that through, because it poses problems for density. But if they are residential use, we do have um, <coughs> policies in our official plan that says any surplus commercial lands, tourist commercial, general commercial, downtown commercial, could be used for residential purposes. So if there's a surplus need, so it could be processed through that way. Um, but it would be nicer to have some guidelines as to what it is, but we'll just consider it a residential use. Council is going to hear a little bit later about changes to the Lundy's Lane B I or C I P, where we would be opening up our grants for residential units. So I suppose somebody could say, "I'm going to take a motel, I'm going to apply for site-specific zone change to be an S R O, and then I'm going to apply for my grant." Well, it would be a tax increment grant. So um, maybe there's a whole package there. I don't know, but so to the aldermen's or councillor's point, there's an avenue that we could deal with a zoning bylaw amendment without 
policies using our residential policies. I'm not sure if that's the intent, but we could do it. Thank you. Okay, so we've got the motion. <clears throat> okay, Councillor Campbell. Opposed. Councillor Dabrowski. For. Uh, Councillor Lococo. I'm so confused, I'm sorry. Can I have some direction that if you vote for this, what, what bylaw information is going to follow this? What do the owners have to do or not do? I'm Mr. Sorry, I'm confused. So, so you, your worship, so an owner of a motel would come into City Hall, he'd make an application for a rezoning to add a single room occupancy building and single room occupancy use as permitted on that site specific property. So 123 Any Street, if the zone tourist commercial or has a motel obviously. Um, they would go through, they would go to pre-consultation, they would be told any report studies, um, engineering works that need to be done. Um, then they'd proceed to a neighborhood meeting where all the businesses would be notified and they'd come out to the neighborhood meeting and provided that would give them a chance to modify the dra drawings, plans, concepts. The, the be scheduled for a public meeting such as this one and then all the people in the area within 120 meters that's 400 feet would be notified they could come out and oppose it come out and support it um, whichever and then council make a decision through you and the mayor i i do understand that part what i'm having a hard time understanding is at that point what is the owner of the hotel motel supposed to do? Are they supposed to supply a, a kitchen? Are they supposed to supply um, a, a fridge? That, that's where I'm asking. I don't believe so. Yes, Mr. Lewich. So if that goes through, you know, and I don't know, we, we, do, we should probably be doing a licensing bylaw too. Um, and I already said we need to modify it, but the regulations under the draft bylaw the council saw tonight says that <coughs> The operator shall ensure that an SRO unit provides the following. A private bathroom, most motels have that, so it's not an issue. A refrigerator or mini fridge. And an area for food preparation and consumption, which may include a counter or table and chairs with or without a sink. I did hear a comment that might be inappropriate to be washing dishes in the in the bathroom or in the bathroom sink or <coughs> top. So we could say with a sink. Um, it's easy enough to do if you back up a counter to the vanity of the bathroom, uh, you can use the same plumbing to connect a sink for the washing of dishes. Um, so at this point, the licensing says with or without, we could take it back and say with, uh, we're gonna make you some other changes and bring it back for council to look at. We could bring it to the next council meeting and say, take a look, is this what you think you want? We've modified it. We could highlight the changes in red so that it's easy to, to distinguish. That's why I asked that we review the policies. Right. Does that help you? <clears throat> Do you want us to come back to you? Or <laughs> Sorry, if we don't do anything, it's not being enforced. It won't be enforced uh, anyway. Right, because, because where we are right now. It's been, and the motion's been defeated for the recommendation. Right. But if someone wants to become an SRO, they apply and then they follow all of that. Yes. Okay. But Councillor Peter Angel's asking that it be reviewed as well. Right. Because right now, with or without a sink, things like this can be addressed in the future. Okay. So after hearing and understanding the motion, <laughs> Councillor Lacoco. I'm for. That was for. <coughs> Councillor Peter Angelo. Okay. Councillor Strange. For. Councillor Thompson. Yes. Mayor Diodati. In favor. And that passes. The second part of the motion was that the city advertise for any property owners that are interested in making application for a single room occupancy application. 
affordable housing? Yeah, it does not exist. Really. Okay, for affordable housing? And not necessarily exclusively no, for exactly. yeah. right. And I talked about the fact that it could be a percentage of the building. Um, right. But, I mean, by offering land, I think it's... it's uh, so affordable uh, housing component. Exactly. Okay, Councillor Campbell. In favor. Councillor Dabrowski. In favor. Councillor Lococo. In favor. Councillor Peter Angelo. Yes. Councillor Strange. Yes. Four. Councillor Thompson. Yes. And Mayor Diodati. Yes. And that two passes. And lastly, the third part of the motion was that staff investigate the use of a community imp improvement plan or CIP for affordable housing. Councillor Campbell. In favor. Councillor Dabrowski. Yes. Councillor Lococo. In favor. Councillor Peter Angelo. Uh -huh. Councillor Strange. Four. Councillor Thompson. Yes. And Mayor Diodati. Aye. And that passes as well. All right. Thank you. Yes, Councillor Thompson. Yes. Can we also include the motion? that uh, we direct staff to be in touch with the region, the province, and the federal government, and follow up on this $55 billion uh, and bring it back to the council as soon as uh, in the July meeting so we can accomplish some of the housing issues. Great that's, idea. That's what we have to do, and we have to have the we're not going to do it with the region and the city. We got to have uh, the federal government, the provincial government, and especially when they announce 55 billion, uh, we got to get our uh, request in immediately. Okay, so we've got a motion by <coughs> Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Mococo, that uh, we look at accessing this 55. Yeah, and have staff uh, 55 um, is a billion dollar fund for affordable housing and partnership with all levels of government to do this, and staff will come back with a report. And get the uh, members of parliament involved too. And engage our MPs. Yeah. We'll call that vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. And you know, one thing I, I got to say, I, when I hear all the problems with the Landlord Tenant Act, it seems the Landlord Tenant Act is designed to protect the tenants. And it does such a great job that it actually hurts them because then landlords don't want them in. So it's gone so far, the pendulum swung so far one way, it's actually hurting the tenants now. And tonight's a classic example. The 10% are ruining it for the 90%. And they're being allowed to under the guise of the Landlord Tenant Act. And I think it needs some reviewing as well. I wish the province would have another look and give us the teeth that we need, give the police the teeth that they need and give our bylaw enforcement the teeth that they have. So maybe maybe we need to send a separate, uh, if someone would want to make a motion, that we ask the province to review the Landlord Tenant Act. Yes, Councillor Lococo. On that or something else? Well, it might, go, it might as well go in with this. I wanted to put a motion forward about the cuts from the provincial government. So I guess the federal is giving us some money, but the provincial government has taken money. A lot of municipalities are putting this motion forward and it says that council express its appreciation to staff, the service providers, community partners and agencies for their work to support vulnerable and homeless, homeless populations in the community and that staff continue to engage with the Niagara Region Community Services and community partners to provide outreach and support services and report quarterly to council and that the city calls on the provincial government to reverse current and previous funding cuts for affordable housing, homelessness, mental health and addiction programs and further that the city of Niagara Falls delegation will express these concerns and requests to provincial ministers at the upcoming AMO conference and work with the government relations team to demonstrate the need for increasing funding. Okay, well why don't we do that one? We'll do that one on its own. That's a, that's a handful. Uh, do we have a seconder for uh, Councillor Lacocco's motion? Councillor Campbell? Okay. <laughs> You're being funny. Okay. So we'll call the vote on uh, Ms. Lococo's uh, motion. All those in favor? Okay. Councilor Lococo's, thank you very much for that. And um, I would ask someone, if someone from council would be so kind as to make the motion that we ask the province to uh, review the Landlord Tenant Act and uh, 
you know, thank you. So a uh, motion by Councillor Strange, second by Councillor Dabrowski. A conflict? Oh, your, your landlord. Okay. Um, and uh, and reason being, and again, I said it earlier, uh, that the Landlord Tenant Act was designed to protect the uh, la the tenant. Unfortunately, it's protecting them so well, it's actually hurting and punishing them. Uh, and sadly, we heard tonight, typically 90% of the tenants are terrific, 10% are trouble. And I know our bylaw and our police officials, their hands are tied. They're limited to what they can do because of the act that protects these people, including the 10%. We're making it bad for everyone, landlords and tenants alike. And if this could somehow be reviewed and be given teeth to deal with the offending tenants so that it won't negatively affect the other 90% and the landlords and everyone else involved in law enforcement. So we'll call that vote. All those conflict. in favor? Conflict. Uh, conflict with declared conflicts from Campbell, Cario, no, okay. Uh, Campbell and Peter Angelo. All those in favor? Okay, it's unanimous otherwise. Thank you for that. Okay, so uh, moving along to item, planning item seven point. Thank you to everyone who came out for this. Appreciate your patience. Item 7.2. Mr. Clerk, would you please introduce this next item on the agenda? Okay, public meeting in accordance with section 17 of the Planning Act and the Ontario Regulation 54306 is now being convened to consider amendments to the Lundy's Lane Community Improvement Plan. Notice was given through the publication of an advertisement in the Niagara Falls Review on Saturday, May 25th, 2019 and by first class mail to various agencies on Friday, May 24th, 2019. Anyone who would like notice of the amendments to the Lundy's Lane Community Improvement Plan shall leave their name on the sign-in sheets outside council chambers. Okay, thank you very much. What's that? Well, I'm not there yet. I'd ask our director of planning, Mr. Rilovich, to outline the amendments to the CIP. Thank you, Worship. I, again, I, <coughs> excuse me, I, due to staffing shortage, I don't have a PowerPoint tonight. So, uh, very quickly then, this is a city a staff uh, city staff initiated amendment the Lundy's Lane Community Improvement Plan to uh, adjust the boundary and to alter the tax inc increment based tax incentive of that community improvement plan. The um, um, Lundy's Lane Community Improvement Plan was adopted in uh, 2008 last year to help stimulate, and stimulate the rehabilitation of properties on Lundy's Lane and to help with the beautification and this was done, uh, to be done through various incentive uh, programs for the private properties. Residential intensification along the lane was envisioned as occurring through mixed use development. So typically that would be commercial on the ground floor and residential on the upper floors. Uh, however, at the request of the uh, Lundy's Lane BIA, council directed staff to create an initiative uh, or an incentive for residential only development. Uh, so the proposed amendment to the tax um, increment based incentive program would allow properties within the CIP to seek an incentive for residential development without a requirement for a commercial component. Um, staff found this to be in keeping with the vision and guiding principles of the CIP and the residential only incentive program would then be available to multi-unit developments. Um, and it would um, um, and it uh, would not uh, apply to properties that um, to, uh, that do not front directly on Lemmy's Lane. Um, in addition, then uh, council had asked that uh, staff investigate uh, expanding the CIP boundaries to include seven uh, five eight seven three Brookfield Avenue. This is the site of the former Broadway Motel, and that was uh, demolished, uh, I think, at that last, at the council meeting when this direction came through. Uh, council dealt with a rezoning application for a uh, new residential development on that property. So uh, staff is recommending that the mapping be uh, adjusted to accommodate that, but in looking at that property, staff also identified 
a number of other properties um, that have the same characteristics and those are shown on the appendix and I'm, again I'm sorry that I have a PowerPoint but that's appendix A which is page four of your report and so it identifies the specific properties and there are one, two, three, four, five, six, six properties that um, would also have similar characteristics to, to Brookfield. They are designated and zoned tourist commercial. Um, so if they wish to redevelop, they would uh, go through a site specific zoning as uh, the former Broadway uh, hotel or motel did and uh, they would be eligible for um, application for this grant program under the CIP. So uh, staff is recommending that the boundaries be adjusted and that the uh, program uh, be expanded. So um, before you tonight then council is, uh, staff is recommending that we revise the Lundy's Lane area boundary and to add a new multi-unit residential use as an eligible cost under section 3.2.3 of the tax increment based grant that the amendments be brought back to Council in July for adoption <coughs> and the amendment to the Lundy's Lane Improvement Plan be sent to the province uh, under Section 28.5 uh, review of the Planning Act. So those are the recommendations. Thank you, Mr. Hurlovich. Any questions of Council for Mr. Hurlovich? Okay, Council will now hear from anyone of the public who wishes to speak to this proposed amendment. Is there anyone here from the public? Okay, seeing none. The public meeting with respect to the proposed amendment to the Lundy's Lane CIP is now concluded. Councillor Thompson? Moved uh, by the <laughs> uh, Recommendations moved by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Dabrowski. All those in favor? That's approved. Thank you. Okay, moving on to reports 8.1 Insurance Renewal Report. Moved by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Cario that we move the report. Councillor Lococo. I just have a question. I know it's the third year of three years and the municipal insurance program expires this year, but I'm wondering, do we send this out for quotes on a regular basis? Um, uh, Tiffany, who are you gonna give that quote? Would you answer that, Ms. Clark? Yeah. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. Yeah, at the end of the three year term, we'll have to RFP. Yeah. All those in favor? That's approved. Thank you. Uh, 8.2 Ontario Living Wage Network Initiative. Uh, it's, uh, okay. Moved by Councillor Thompson to receive. Second by Councillor Cario. All those in favor? Okay. Thank you. 8.3 Playground Improvement Program. This is to install equipment at five parts, parks. Yes, five parks. Moved by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Campbell. All those in favor? Thank you. Uh, asset management policy. We're looking to approve the current uh, attached asset management policy. Moved by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Dabrowski. All those in favor? That's approved. Thank you. Um, overview of proposed amendments, Bill 108. It's recommended that we receive the report. Moved by Councillor Cario, second by Councillor Thompson. Uh, Did you want to speak to it? Yeah. Uh, should we not uh, uh, be doing the same as some of the other municipalities, expressing our concern about uh, <laughs> Bill 108 uh, to the provincial uh, government? We could. Um, I, I would suggest uh, we look at the other uh, comments of the other municipalities we've had in the past and uh, formulate our own uh, resolution to uh, uh, Premier uh, Chevy, or no, Ford, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. So, so maybe uh, we'll receive the information, ask for staff to, to bring us back a report yes. on that? Uh, Does that take humor come with age? <laughs> Do they make Chevys anymore? I don't know. <laughs> Oh, yes, Council, I'm um, Councillor. Sorry, not to insult you, uh, Mr. Hurlovich. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what comments we might be able to make to the municipality or to the province since Bill 108 was um, um, 
enacted in June. Oh, so right. It's, it's already in law, so the other they're, ones they're currently working. After anyway. so and we received them, though, yeah. <laughs> and filed them. Yeah, and we, uh, we still rescind our opinions. I can pull those out of the reports that I used to create this report. Okay. All right. That's great. We'll call that. All those in favor? Okay. Thank you. Um, 8.6. Decorative. The um, the Peter Angelo decorative entrance features and wall subdivision of city policy. Moved by Councillor Peter Angelo. Second by Councillor Strange. Did you want to speak to that, Councillor? Yeah, yes. Your Worship. I just wanted to say thanks uh, very much to staff. Um, I find the report uh, to be exactly where I thought that yep. we should be. With the city taking responsibility, also taking uh, also taking subsidies or deposits on all these walls, so that if and when a maintenance issue arises, that the city is in control of it and it doesn't fall back on one single landowner yeah. to fix a wall that's there for an entire subdivision. I think it's a great policy. I do too, and I'm happy it's here. Thank you, uh, to Mr. Sorry, Nick. Is that the name of it? Peter yeah, the Peter Angel. I just added that in now. So we've got the motion. All those in favor? Oh, wait, wait, wait hold on. We've got Councilor Coco. I agree that the um, cost shouldn't be on the individual homeowner that lives on that lot. The problem I'm struggling with is there's 17 that are listed there, which means if they're approximately $35,000 to fix and the city takes them over, we're looking at $595,000 that we just put onto the taxpayers to fix those walls. It's great moving forward that we have um, the, it, that it's implemented that it, they will give us a deposit, but what about the, the 17 that are already there? The taxpayers are gonna pay for those. Well, I would think they're they're not all in a state of disrepair, no, so it's not. gonna happen. Some of them are, were built properly, as they should be, and they'll be fine, uh, but I think it's more of the liability to uh, the person that lives there when the walls fall, such as in Mount Carmel subdivision, and secondly, uh, the, the stress that it puts on one. We had one situation where one resident took it upon himself to you know, attach aluminum siding to it and a number of other things that didn't exactly go along with it. So, I, so anyway, noted, appreciate that, <laughs> Councillor, appreciate you bringing attention to that. We'll call the vote, all those in favor? That's approved, thank you. Uh, 8.7, the Gale Center Emergency uh, Repair. Moved by Councillor uh, Cario, second by Councillor Strange, all those in favor? It's approved, thank you. And now to the consent agenda. Moved by, okay, hold on. Councilor Coco first, yes. Which did you want lifted? receivables report okay receivables okay so let's start with that one why don't we start with the receivables uh, F 2926 oh, what's that 10 one uh, no F 201926 is that what you're talking about yes yeah okay did you want to talk about it I just wanted to thank um, Tiffany Clark and her team Amber for changing the report I asked about the tax receivables, how much were current year, how much were past year, and they've divided onto three years and prior, two years and one year. So I'd like to thank them for doing that. Very good. Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, next, uh, you wanted to deal with, um, uh, which one, I'm sorry, 04? 2019-04, cooling yep. stations. Cooling stations during heat advisories, yes. Yes. I just wanted the residents to know that we do have the cooling stations available and that it's they will be available when the humidix is at least 40 degrees or higher under two consecutive days, daily 31 degrees or two consecutive days and overnight 20 degrees or higher with two consecutive days. Uh, people can go to the Coronation Center, the Gale Center, McBain, Victoria, libraries. You can find it on the website and there's all the outdoor pools and splash pads as well. Yep, which will extend hours as well to the pools. Yes, Mr. Clerk. Uh, just to, in addition to that, I just wanted to point out, we did receive correspondence today from uh, Christopher Dunn, he's manager at uh, uh, Niagara Falls Library, and he wanted to point out that the other branches of the library in Chippewa and at Stanford Center would also be available as well. Okay. Great. 
Okay, so uh, motion, I can't remember who made the motion to pass the consent agenda, who was it? We have not. Oh, we didn't? Okay, moved by Councilor Peter Angelo. Yeah, I'm sorry, Councilor Thompson, you want to comment? Yeah, I, I want to uh, comment on the... Uh, Cooling stations? No, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. Not yet. Okay, so moved by Councilor Peter Angelo, seconded <laughs> by Councilor Dabrowski that we move the consent agenda. All those in favor? And that's approved unanimously, thank you. So now, 10.1, Ron, the request, we received a request from um, a gentleman, a group from the Serbian community requesting the council rename Bender Street to Nikola Tesla Way. So, did you want to comment, Councilor Thompson? I'll just make a motion. Uh, first of all, uh, I agree with uh, um, Mr. Siriani and uh, also uh, uh, his name? Uh, Sherman Zavitz, who indicated uh, the name Bender uh, has a very historic history for the city of Niagara Falls, and it was named that. Um, uh, keep Nikola Tesla. Um, as a matter of fact, the first day that I was elected mayor in 1970, 1978, um, I had to go down in the Parks Commission uh, on their property and there was a little monument with uh, all the people from the Serbian community uh, recognizing Mr. Tesla. And then a couple of years ago, there's a beautiful monument that's right across the road from uh, the uh, Parks Commission uh, Table Rock, which is substantial. But uh, Nikola Tesla should be recognized also. And I would uh, leave the name Bender alone and refer Nikola Tesla to our staff to uh, see where there's an appropriate opportunity on the street uh, with new development and subdivisions that comes forward and for that to staff. Uh, we will, and uh, that's a great motion. Um, the one thing that should be brought up, there currently is a Tesla, uh, is it Tesla? Court. Court <coughs> in the city. So the concern was brought forward by staff that having two streets with the same name. So they're suggesting calling it Nikola Tesla Way versus Tesla Court. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I know uh, um, Pat, Patrick, our uh, town crier, had a lot of ideas. We discussed on Saturday night about other streets that could be named uh, in respect to Nikola Tesla, the gentleman who did, had many inventions, including uh, DC, our, uh, alternating current. You know, the reason we have all the, the lights working right now, and, and he did a lot of creations. He was a genius, and what a great way to recognize him. So. Uh, there's a motion by Councillor Thompson that we send this back to staff to come back with some suggestions. Uh, there was one even included, uh, suggested naming the 405, which goes into the U.S., which is between Niagara Falls uh, uh, and uh, Niagara Lake, and goes right through the power plant, basically, uh, to the American power plant, which could also be quite appropriate, which would involve the province. So there's a lot of good ideas out there. Maybe this wasn't the best idea. So there's uh, the motion by Councillor Thompson, and it was and seconded by Councillor Lacoco uh, that we do just that. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? No. no. Oh, oh, so hold on. Sorry, I never know what, if you're supporting if you're just. Telling oh, Your Worship, I wanted to see like um, as we send it back to staff, and I know that our town crier is here uh, in uh, in the audience. Thanks for sticking around so long. I think there was also Mr. Matthews that sent a, a letter in asking us to keep Bender. And, uh, and I'm fine with keeping Bender the way it is, but when our staff is discussing it, is there going to be anyone from the Serbian community there, or are we going to make a decision and then bring it back? No, I think they're going to bring suggestions to us, and then the Serbian community or the representatives that brought this forward could be engaged at that point. There has been some preliminary, they reached out to our staff, and there was some informal discussions around it. Uh, their main thing was they, they think it should be near the falls, and it should be a significant street. Uh, not a back street kind of thing, in the full name, not, you know, the way they did at Burlington. They renamed Burlington Street.
to Nikola Tesla, yeah. and they're looking for something like that uh, significance. So, okay. so they would absolutely be a part of it. We're not just going to say here it is. We're going to come back with some suggestions to council. And I agree that um, that we should do something significant because I think what Tesla did was uh, monumental in terms of electricity. And I know you mentioned <coughs> alternating current. I'm very impressed that you knew that. But way back, in, way back just before the 1900s, uh, in Niagara Falls, they actually had a contest, and it was uh, Edison and Tesla um, who were involved in the contest to see who would then get the rights to build the world's first uh, hydroelectric power plant. And uh, uh, Edison was all about uh, DC, which was direct current, and Tesla was all about AC, which was alternating current. And uh, in the end, alternating current, it was proven, was the uh, preferred method to be able to transfer electricity far distances. Yes. So that's the one that won. And that's what gave Niagara Falls its, uh, then he partnered, I believe, with Westinghouse. Yes, he did. And that's what gave Niagara Falls its first ever hydroelectric power plant, the world's first ever. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it is monumental in the sense that uh, every city and everywhere in the world now uses electricity and transfers at great distances. And it's because of his, uh, his genius idea, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. So, I mean, he should have something prominent here in Niagara Falls. We should be trumpeting the fact that you know, that Tesla uh, basically came up with the invention of alternating current and uh, proved it here in Niagara Falls first before anywhere else in the world, so it'd be great. And, I, and a little extra trivia for you, in addition to that, many other inventions, uh, but Edison, to show, to try to prove that alternating current was dangerous, electrocuted an elephant and killed them to prove how dangerous alternating current was, which was a little bit of a ploy to get people to go toward direct Current, which was obviously not the the choice way of transport. <laughs> I'm full of trivial information. <laughs> okay, did we did we did the motion already? Like, I'm so confused. There's been so much going on. Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Thank you. All right, 10.2 Niagara Regional Housing Quarterly Report. Uh, recommendations that we receive the quarterly report. Moved by Councillor Peter Angel, second by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? That's unanimous, thank you. Item 10.3, ash trees in the town of Fort Erie and the region of Niagara. So there is a resolution um, f recommending that we receive the information from the town of St. Uh, Niagara. I, I, I received. Moved by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Cario that we receive the report. All those in favor? That's approved, thank you. Uh, we did 10.4 already. 10.5, noise ball law exemptions, summer blues in the park. Uh, moved by <laughs> Councillor Strange, seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? Oh, no, Councillor Lococo, sorry. I think Mr. Barker is here, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, oh, okay. Thank you. Sorry, wasn't aware. Come to the microphone if you would, sir. If you could state your name and your address. My name is Councillor Barker, 6855 Christine Court. This is the second time I'm making an appearance to the council. I believe the first time regarding this matter was three years ago. Please correct me, Mr. Mayor. That's the year you moved out of Kalejiro. I remember that to be three years ago. Is that correct? I At the so. time, <laughs> the first positive step before the motion was voted on was one of the councillors. I'm sorry, I can't remember his name said let's amend the motion and the amendment was to mitigate to take steps to mitigate noise if i'm correct in thinking that was three years ago nothing has happened since then and if you are wondering where my house is 6855 christine court you could go to the park turn your back towards Kalajiro by standing at the back of the stand there and my house is across the street. So when I lift my head up and I look, I see the bandstand. Moved in in 2005, there was no building. There was only one weekend activity, which was either the weekend of labor weekend or the week after, it was for two days and I certainly could tolerate that. In the past 14 years, 
This is the story, if you aren't aware of it, of a camel and the Bedouin finding a shady spot in a tent, asking the owner, can I have my camel? It's a little animal, stick its head under the tent. Before you know it, the entire camel is inside the tent. So now there are routine, several, sometimes six or seven weekly events. So I ask your permission, Mr. Mayor, and the indulgence of the council to allow me to speak to both 10.5 and 10.6. And the reasoning for that is, on the 4th of June, when I contacted and received a response from the clerk, the clerk said, the only thing that's coming up, because my request was, there is always a request by the people managing the park. At this time, regarding the Tuesday, Thursday concerts. And I received a response saying, there is no initiative by the parks people for the Tuesday, Thursday concerts. But at that point, the only thing that was planned was this activity in August. Had I known at that point that there was going to be two motions, I would have requested to speak to both of them because they both relate to noise as such, although they are different activities. And if I may also ask, I have another resident with me. He's a very special resident. He's been here since 6 o'clock. He was told he couldn't speak because he didn't come forward. He's an 87-year-old gentleman who lives in that area, and I ask for your permission at the expense of making me be quiet, that you let him speak as well. Because yeah, in the past, I was accused of being the only one who had difficulties with the noise from the park. And that clearly is not true. If an 87-year-old gentleman could come here at 6, wait until this time, I'm sure he is as hungry as you and I. I think he deserves the right to speak in addition to handing in his written comments. So with your permission, I will yield the floor to him and I will speak afterwards. Yep, you'd like to come forward, sir? Um, Your Worship, uh, members of the council, my name is Holloway, Rich Holloway, and I live very close to Fireman's Park. Um, what concerns me uh, is that while neighbors have been waiting about a year um, for the council to arrange a conciliatory meeting among all the people involved in Fireman's Park to discuss the noise. Um, there's a three million dollar plan afoot uh, for the council to enable the park to have more and bigger events, more noise. Um, there's been no response to our suggestion which was that the loudspeakers and perhaps the performance area should be moved further away from the residential area, which is only across one roadway, so the noise does carry. Um, the problem can be mitigated, uh, and it's been proved this year because it's a little bit better. It can be mitigated by the hand on the volume control, um, but that doesn't always work. There are leaps of, of volume, um, and no one can know when that's coming um, coming about. Um, the movement of the loudspeakers uh, would be a much more permanent solution uh, for us anyhow. Um, the council does have noise control um, bylaw, which I'm sure everybody has read. It's on the internet. Um, the problem is in the interpretation of it. Um, when we first started making complaints about the noise, um, we were told that um, noise was subjective. Well, of course it's subjective, but the noise we were complaining about was so loud um, and the, the bass was so booming, um, it, it really was in, in, intolerable. In any case, other local authorities have managed to, uh, to monitor noise from events um, with a simple decibel meter. They're very cheap, um, very easy to use. Um, for instance, in 2017, Kitchener 
had a lot of complaints after an annual event and they uh, decided that in future the organisers of events were to stick to 55 <coughs> decibels at the point of reception. That's in neighbours' neighbors gardens. Um, uh, do that or be fined $10,000. Uh, this council, I think, has a, a curious view um, of the bylaw. It seems to think that noise, it can only act on noise if it's made during the specifically silent hours. That's from nine o'clock in the evening or later, if the council gives permission, until seven o'clock in the morning. Well, if you take that view, it means that, with respect to the legal section, um, it means that people can kick up a fuss in the rest of the time, all day long, and can't be, can't be prosecuted. I don't think that's what the bylaw means at all. Um, if it is, if it is the view of the council, then I would remind you that the intent of the bylaw is very clearly stated in it. It says, quote, no person shall make, cause or permit noise or vibration which is likely to disturb the quiet peace, rest, enjoyment, comfort, or convenience of the inhabitants of the municipality. In fact, sometimes this noise is so great that we can't use our gardens. Uh, we go inside, and uh, if the base is on, then even inside we hear, we hear the noise. It doesn't seem to be necessary. Um, I, I think the bylaw really needs a, a, a legal view an objective legal view um, for the interpretation of it. Um, and I think that the best solution would be to move the source of the noise away from the residences. And I hope you'll think about this and help make up for the very long period um, of non-communication. And before I finish, one other oddity. The council allows a motor car rally that we know from experience can be very noisy. Um, they do that while two specific prohibitions in the bylaw are the revving of engines and the hooting of horns. Well, that's bound to come about during a car rally. Um, that's what I'd like to say. Thank you very much for hearing me out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Holloway. I've got some copies of um, my speaking note if anybody yep, would we like. We can it. get that to the clerk and share that. Yes, sure. I've got them on the over here. Thank you. Thank you. I hope when I first spoke, I was shouting. I hope at least one person in this room was negatively impacted by that shouting. <coughs> so let me say, at this point, the last thing I'm going to repeat to this council, as I did last time. Any of you who feel that noise doesn't hurt, you are welcome to come to my house on any Tuesday, Thursday night, after 7 o'clock, or any other time when they are playing music that you know of because you gave permission. I'll certainly give you coffee and tea. I won't give you alcoholic beverages. My wife is a good cook. I will give you one of her delicious cakes. The requirement being you'll have to stay there for an hour. I've been there every Tuesday, Thursday for the past 14 years. I consider that I'm being evicted out of my house on certain weekends because the motion here, in line with what Reg said, <coughs> because the new interpretation now with the staff changeover with the clerk, and with the new bylaw enforcement officer, because the previous group said, if two people object, then they call the police. The police could come there even before seven o'clock and before nine o'clock, shut everything down. The new interpretation is we can't do anything until nine o'clock. The bylaw, due to the new interpretation, is silent. That to me sounds like 
I'm sorry to say, a horrible interpretation. So let me read the first motion, 10-5. An exemption to the city's noise bylaw, which is unclear. Asking for it to be changed to 10-30. When I moved, they used to play on Tuesday, Thursday nights from 7 to 10. I wrote at least half a dozen times and said, could we move it back to 7 to 9? And as a reward for my initiative, I think it was three years ago, we got the time extended to 10.30. I could never find out what the logic was, why it should move from 10 to 10.30. I'm an avid follower of music, and I go to conferences, and I go to plays, there are very few movies, very few plays that last for three and a half hours. I'd like to know what was the reasoning brought forward to the council to push it from 7 to 10 to 7 to 10.30. In fact, by their own admission, later on past August in September, it becomes so dark at 9.30, some of the people start leaving anyhow. So I have a lot of issues with this new movement. The rest of it says, Thursday nights, then in parentheses from second Tuesday. Well, is it going to be just Tuesday and Thursday nights? Or if I read the motion without the parentheses, it just simply says Thursdays. So I don't understand whether they mean both Tuesdays and Thursdays, as it has been the case for the past 14 years. Or do they mean just Thursdays? I'd like to seek some clarification on that. It does say that. It does say Thursdays. I'm also surprised that from second Tuesday, that seems to be retroactive. I'm a university professor. I worked as chairman of the university senate at Brock University, and I was a member of it for 25 years. I have never heard of something coming forward on the 25th of the month that goes back to the second after the clerk told me shortly after the 4th of June that they hadn't made an application. I think they are getting all the breaks. It's high time. I beg the council to please, you are also our representative. And the place where the park is located does not belong to the park people, nor with respect does the city have absolute control of it. So I read to you from the Niagara Escarpment Commission 2017 plan, purpose. The purpose of this plan is to provide for the maintenance of the Niagara Escarpment and land in its vicinity substantially as a continuous natural environment. Was the movement of the building from its original place down the hill to the new place? Because there was a hearing organized by the Niagara Escarpment Commission back in 2012, and people in the vicinity, including myself, two other people, either sent messages or showed up. I showed up and the permission was given to move the building to its existing place and there were several restrictions. And the clerk wrote to me saying he has downloaded that. The first restriction is there will be no banquet room in that building. For the last three years they've been advertising banquets and organizing weddings. So it has become out of control. It's not just a matter of. Sir, is your complaint the noise or the group? Well, let's the stick group, to the noise. We're dealing with a bylaw noise the issue. Group, let's sir. not talk about the usage of the facility. This here, we've given you a chance to speak to the issue. So but I'd the appreciate group, you sticking to the topic of noise. But the group produces noise. Sir. The banquet issue that you speak of is not the noise issue you speak of. You're speaking of blues in the park, Tuesdays, possibly Thursdays. Please stick to this issue. This is a community group of volunteers. They're not perfect. 
They're here volunteering, raising money for the community. So if you have a noise issue, that's legitimate. Let's deal with it. But please, don't go to the heart of the volunteer group. I'm not going to the heart of yes, it. Yes, you are. And I'm going to ask you to stick to the bylaw of noise only. The so noise. if decibel meters is a way we're going to deal with it, so be it. But let's stick to this topic, please. With respect, groups produce noise. The next item, how many of these activities are we going to have on a weekend? This one just states one. I don't know, in the past there were several weekends. And this one, by itself, 11. Why must it go from seven to 11? What's the starting time? According to the new interpretation, the bylaw is being interpreted, it doesn't say anything, as we can't do anything until nine o'clock. Well, in the past, these two-day activities sometimes started at nine in the morning. So on a Saturday, on a Sunday, you may have to listen to the noise. And I don't mean noise pin dropping. I mean with the bass blasting. So much so that in my cupboard, saucers are shaking. 11 o'clock, starting when? How patient do you want us to be? And I take exception, Mr. Mayor, to your comment, depicting them as volunteers and whatever. That's I what think, they are. I think that was uncalled for. Well, then I take exception to you saying us. Who do you speak for? I speak for quite a few of the residents, including one too. who is here. I lived there as long as you did, and I know a lot of the residents, and they don't complain. They love the idea that they live next to a park I, they can walk to. I, I like some of the music as well. It's the bass that goes through my wall that I'm actually complaining about. So can I make a suggestion? Yes, please do. If you'd like us to work with the group to come up with A, sound mitigation, B, uh, decibel meters, and you don't need a machine for decibel meters, you can do it with your smartphone. There's an app you can download. So it's very simply done. And I don't know if 50 decibels is the number or what the decibel number is, but we could work with the group so that everybody could achieve a common goal, a win-win. Because I don't think we need to be adversarial against each other, I think we can find common ground. So why don't we maybe take this in a different direction and have the city engaged on, in helping them to achieve this, this sound that we're looking for. That's an amicable suggestion. And about two years ago, a member of your staff actually proposed that for the three groups to get together. <laughs> As rich is my witness, we are still waiting for that member of your staff to organize that meeting. So we are all for that. And we were also told by the previous bylaw enforcement officer that because Reg actually went out and bought a device to measure the decibels. He said, you could throw that away because we aren't interested in the decibels being measured. Yes, we'd be very happy for some reasonable number in terms of decibels to be included somewhere in the bylaws. So I'm all for what you are suggesting. But I also suggest that that was actually proposed a year and a half, two years ago. We are still meeting a member of your staff to come through with that promise. Okay, well, I'm not sure where that is, but we can move it forward today. Would you like me to send you a copy of that email message from a member of your staff saying three components of this group should get together with the date on it? Okay, well, I, I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's more. necessary either, but that suggestion was made and it was welcomed by us. Okay. So maybe I could make a suggestion in council. Uh, yeah, make an amendment to uh, to the motion that we, and this is official, not uh, an email, but in a motion of council that we have staff meet with the Stanford Center Volunteer Firefighter Group to come up with mitigation members or uh, measures for sound, and as well, we can come up with a way of measuring it. Would you also include that that meeting is a third party, any of the residents of Kalejiro who wish to show up? Or a certain number, up to four or five, whatever, I think we are a party. Absolutely. Okay, so we've got the motion by Councillor Strange. 
Seconded by Councillor Lococo. Yes, you want to speak to it, Councillor? I think there's some confusion about the Tuesday and the Thursday. This one is specifically for Blues in the Park, which is on Thursday. Tuesday is Twilight Tuesday. They're both run by Fireman's Park, so in one it just says Blues in the Park, but the Tuesday is in the actual agenda list. So that's the Tuesday and Thursday. Okay. Yeah. I just point out that uh, the word Tuesday on the agenda is just a typo. The request from the group was only referring to the summer blues in the park being held uh, on this on Thursdays. Okay. So is everybody clear on the motion? Let's call the vote. All those in favor? Okay. And that's unanimous. So we've got your coordinates. We'll be able to reach out to you and inform you when this meeting is going to take place. And then hopefully we can come to a solution that's good for everybody. I sure hope so, and I appreciate your effort. Thank you. You can bring the cake if you don't mind. <laughs> Only if you come to my patio and stay there for 60 minutes, sir. I'm, I'll be in the park. <laughs> <laughs> if you tell me, sir, no kidding aside, that you will stay at the park 60 minutes, I'll bring you your coffee or tea. I enjoy the music. All right. So do I, but I don't enjoy it when my... I, and I understand that. Thank you. Thank you thank, for being here. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, moved by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Strange. Ten six ten seven. All those in favor? Thank you. That's approved. Okay. Ten eight. The Clifton Hill BIA moved by Councillor Strange, second by Councillor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? That's approved. Thank you. Ten point nine. Association of International Horticulture Producers. Uh, requesting uh, that we refer, refer this to staff. Moved by Councillor Cario that we refer this to staff. Second by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? That's approved. Thank you. 10.10. .10, the Niagara Region uh, has an updated secondhand smoking vaping bylaw. Moved by Councillor Peter Angelo. Second by Councillor Cario. All those in favor? That's approved. Thank you. Ratification of in camera, Mr. Clerk? Uh, nothing to report. Okay, thank you. And the bylaws. Oh wait, no, we've got two resolutions. Yeah, I would move the resolution. Okay, uh, two, so two resolutions in regard to land use and payment. and payment. Yep, payment for Niagara Peninsula Energy. Okay, uh, moved by Councilor Peter Angel. Second question or second? Okay, second by Councilor Strange. Question by Councilor Lacoco. Um, regarding 12.2, the demand for payment, I was wondering if we could have a verbal report about what exactly we're doing. Um, some of the residents don't understand what it is. Okay, thank you. Ask our CEO if he would uh, be so kind as to give us an update on that resolution. Well, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, back when the uh, Niagara Falls Hydro had merged with uh, Penn West Hydro to become MPEI, at that time there was a uh, $22 million note taken by the corporation that's been held since that time earning interest. That interest comes into uh, the uh, city revenues. Uh, that note is due in March of next year and uh, there's now advice that those notes will no longer be renewed at preferred interest rates so we've made a recommendation to call the note uh, and bring that revenue into our city coffers. And what are the options for that money? Well, Councilor, that's something that Council is going to have to determine. Uh, the first step will be to get that money uh, in our accounts, and then we'll have a further discussion uh, with Council uh, where they'd like to spend that, whether it be on uh, whatever infrastructure projects they may deem necessary. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? It's approved. New business? No, a motion in the bylaws. Oh yeah, I think we only did the one you're right. Last yeah, motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Strange. The bylaws be given a first, second, and third, third reading. All those in favor? That's approved. Thank you. New, bu new business. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Councillor Peter Angelo. Oh, thanks, Your Worship. Um, uh, I was just wondering. I know you gave a bit of an update on the hydro canal, but we also received an email uh, from. Uh, someone who's already contacted us about the Drummond Road Bridge. So yeah. do you have an update on us for the Drummond Road Bridge? Yeah, uh, uh, myself and the CAO met with uh, the local head of OPG uh, a month or so ago, and uh, they're going to be doing the same kind of barrier on Drummond Road for the canal as they are on um, 
McLeod Road. Okay, that's great. Yeah. And uh, another one, Your Worship, is um, uh, last meeting I brought up the issue of RVs being parked in driveways, and I was yes. wondering whether or not we had a timeline for when staff was going to be coming back with some type of report for council. I'll ask our CAO if he'd like to comment on that. Mr. Mayor, I can't give you a definite date right tonight. Uh, it is on our outstanding list. Um, I'm just not sure where the compilation of all that material because I know we had uh, a list of a number of properties where we'd had a complaint before. So I'm not, uh, I'm just not sure where that stands right now. Um, we have two meetings uh, coming up. I, I can pretty well guarantee it won't be for the July meeting, possibly the August meeting. Okay. Um, well, we have an outstanding, uh, we have an outstanding list. I'd love to see that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Your Worship, the last one was uh, grass cutting, and I know I brought it up, and we talked about changes in the policy. We also received an email uh, between last meeting and this meeting. Does that email, do you know, or does staff know, does that email constitute, uh, I guess, bringing something back to council? I didn't see Or I are we still that. planning, or are staff still planning on bringing back some update to the bylaw? That was my only question. Well, I don't know what the email is you're talking about. No, it was only sent to you and the council, but that's okay if you didn't read it. No, but when, which one are you talking about? I get a lot. Oh, no, uh, from our own staff, actually. And it was in reference to, um, and I, I, I'm, I'm not even sure why it was contemplated, but it was whether or not uh, a change would fit into the current bylaw, and it really never was a question of council. It was only a matter of uh, changing the actual bylaw. Obviously, it wouldn't fit into the current bylaw. We'd have to change our bylaw, but we do that all the time. We change bylaws. So um, I guess what, it, what was my question more was, was that email uh, the reference back to council, or are we still waiting for a report to come back? No, we're waiting for a report. It was discussed at council okay. review, and staff are going to come back to us with a way to streamline. Like you, right. you had brought up at the last meeting, that was a great idea. Yeah. Because I said there's a time lag that we want to eliminate. Right. And so they agreed, so they're going to come back to us with a technology that they could on the spot issue a, a notice. Okay. All right. That's good. Thank you. Any other new business? Motion for adjournment. Cool. Councillor Dabrowski, second by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? Whoa. We're adjourned. Thank you.